It's all on the line. It all comes down to week 10. We're talking previews, picks, USFL playoff scenarios, all that and more on episode 61 of the USFL podcast. One, two, three. Oh! Welcome back, everybody, to another amazing edition of the USFL Podcast. I'm the ref representing USFL Newsroom, the leaders in USFL News. And boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, it's a good week. It's a great week. And I'm telling you what, Zachy boy, it might be the best week ever. But before we get into the mix, I already mentioned his name, but we're going to do it again. As always, I'm joined by my man, Zach Kyleman. How you doing today, my friend? Life's good, man. Week 10, a lot of exciting storylines we're going to be talking about. I was about ready to see if I had to fix your uh, tape recorder there. It felt, felt like you were just stuck on repeat <laughs> for how much you were getting ready for that. <laughs> had to come over, maybe reach my hand across the screen and kind of smack it mm-hmm. and get it An back in sync. jukebox, you know? Uh, the old jukebox method. The, uh, <laughs> the, <laughs> I'm sorry. That's how good of that a was, week it is, it. though. I mean, boy, I'll just say it again. Boy, fun, oh, boy, fonts, oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. Gotta get the Fonz action yeah. going. There we go. Lock him exactly, back in. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. But man, week 10. I've been saying it every other week. I can't believe we're at this week, that week, the other week, the next week, the week prior. But we're at week 10. Week it's flipping It's 10. really feeling close to the end, man. It's wild. I'm getting a little sad. There might be a tear in my eye. But before we start crying, we got to go over some housekeeping items. Social media, what the hell are you doing at usfl podcast facebook twitter instagram and even that tiktok baby and i'll tell you i have a couple moves for the summer stock dance and i won't i won't spoil them just yet but we're getting there and you know you're gonna see it but hey if you're not following us make sure you're doing it because you're gonna be missing out on all the good stuff youtube that's the big one If you look below the video, click the subscribe button, click the bell. It builds morale. And Zach, I'll tell you what, there's a lot of people that might need some morale going into week 10, because as we're about to talk about, we essentially have an extra week of playoffs going into the playoffs. And I mean, speaking of playoffs, you know what? At the playoffs, the end of the playoffs, that's the USFL championship And you know the biggest show, the biggest party of the summer is taking place before that bad boy. Right outside, Tom Benson, Hall of Fame Stadium, within the Hall of Fame Village, Summer Stock 2. So nice, we're doing it twice, and this year the party in the parking lot. We're getting the details solidified now, but I'll tell you what, if only half of what we're working on comes true, you will not want to miss this one. 3 p.m. Eastern, we're kicking off. Like I said, the party's in the parking lot. We're doing a live pregame show and tailgate. That's the day of the championship. But guess what? There's yeah. also a day one, 5 p.m. Eastern. We're all meeting up at the Pro Football Hall of Fame for a group tour. We got to get those flags still, but I'll get on the case. Sign me up. And that's at 5 p.m. Eastern on the 30th. And then, of course, July 1st. Everybody knows when the championship is. But if you can't make it to Canton, we get it. We'll also be live on YouTube. We'll have that stream probably posted this weekend. And I would say, once you see it pop up, I would click the reminder. The biggest party of the summer. Summer Stock 2. Zach and the ref. The community is coming in big. You know what, Zach? Let's just start announcing. I know some community guests. Let's so let's just start. You know what? Why not? No Why not? curtains. Let, this let, is what I do. I just start making stuff up on the fly. Well, well, sure. Let's drop a few names. 
Drop a few names. Well, we got. Let's go on we in. We got community legend Ducky. You, you, of course, Ducky would have to be there. But there's a big reason. There's a good reason. There's a great reason because we're announcing the final number from our charity Ducky merch. All of mm-hmm. the money is going to Feeding America, and that's not a joke. That's a fact, Jack. That's the name of the charity, Feeding America. And all of that merch money, and we're going to announce what that final number is. And here's the skinny, folks. If you didn't get your merchy, uh, your merchy, your ducky merch merchy. yet, click the link below because that stuff is going. We're taking it off the marketplace. It's going to become a hot collectible come probably July 2nd because we're going to be too busy enjoying the championship. So get in your buys now, and let's get that number up. At Springstock, hey. it was poetry. It was at sixty nine dollars. Nice, and we'll, ha- we'll keep see. Him building it. And look, I, I'll tell you what: we'd love to keep doing this. Where maybe we, uh, much in the spirit of how Ducky has, uh, as you may have heard, he's got these nice collectible cards. Mm-hmm. He's made for very special folks in the community. Let's just say maybe version two of these shirts we could talk about next mm-hmm. year. You know, you got we got v, you guys. You want to pick up your V one? Got to hurry yep. up. Time's running out. V2 is coming next year, and it still will go to a good cause, I imagine, as well, if we could set that up. So, you know, a little, little nugget of something we might be looking at next I year. Want, I want color-changing shirts. Maybe I can will that into reality. Probably not, because I'm cheap. Cheap, I cheap, need cheap. reflective material yes. on the duck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Summer stock, too. Oh, I am so looking forward to two weeks left. Two weeks weeks. left until summer stock two. Mark those calendars. Like I said, June 30th, 5 p.m. Eastern Pro Football Hall of Fame group tour with the USFL podcast boys. And then day two, July 1st, kicking off the month right, kicking off the USFL championship the right way. Come and join us before the show at 3 p.m. Eastern because the party is most definitely going to be in the parking lot, and you aren't going to want to miss it. Can't Ooh. wait. And hey, you know what? One last thing, because I love you know I love the new shirt this week. I don't know if you saw the Breaking Tea shirt of the week. We got the bowling ball shirt, man. Oh. Dude, the Darius Victor bowling ball shirt. That is one of my favorites of the season so far. Honestly, it's a funny little stat. Uh, Victor, uh, if I am missing something, he's the only one that has two T-shirts to his mm-hmm. name. Mm-hmm. In the leagues, or and that's a Shark random dog. stat. You name it. But Shark Dog's got two technically. Ah, oh, you're right. Thank but you. But he, with he's in a he's in that rare zone. He's still in that. There's only a couple guys there, so it's still like a tip of the hat. But that bowling ball shirt. Now, if you're digging that bowling ball shirt, I'm gonna I'm gonna do you a solid. I could save you a big old ten percent. You just head over to breakingt.com slash USFL newsroom, or simply just use code usfl newsroom it's going to save you 10 percent off any of the merch they got there but especially that bowling ball shirt and because i'm a gamblers fan in the in mark we trust shirt all in all in but we're going to talk about that a little bit later i'm all sad um but we still there is hope (laughs) which we will talk about uh a little bit later as well so zach let me run through the scores real quick for the whole week and then we're gonna we're gonna deep dive these bad boys because there's there's definitely a couple things to take away from week nine. So kicking things off was your Michigan Panthers taking on the Maulers. And you know what? I thought this was gonna be a rebound game for them, but they had some problems. They ultimately ultimately lose 19 to 7 to the Maulers. Moving on to the breakers and the showboats. This one had quite a bit of a rain delay, which I thought might throw the breakers off their lead. But nope, they come out strong, 31-3. Moving on to Sunday, kicking things off, we have the Stallions and the Gamblers. And the Gamblers, they just couldn't find their touch, and the Stallions are finding their rhythm right at the right time. 38-15, they come out hot, finalizing uh, finalizing things up. USFL After Dark, Philadelphia Stars at the New Jersey Generals, potentially the game of the year, maybe of all time. 37-33, 37-33, yeah. the Generals pull it out and keep their playoff hopes alive. Zach, oh boy, what a fun, exciting week. I, This is how you know it was a good week. I'm not even that sad that the Gamblers lost. We had such a fun week of football. 
that final game, we'll talk about it a little bit later, but I will say and reiterate, potentially one of the best games of the season, if not the last two seasons. But let's start with some depressing, depressing stuff first. Michigan Panthers, what the hell is going on? Josh Love, four interceptions, taken on eight sacks. And the sad part of all of this, Zach, the Panthers' defense also played a great game. They did. But the they did. flipping offense could not get things done. Four interceptions. Four interceptions. Only to be fooled. You know, I mean, if you looked at this game going into the second half, the Panthers, they love to do this. They love to get your hopes up on a first drive. Whether it's the first drive of the game or the first drive of the half, they will get you all jived up. Look at us. We're making all of our connections. Our runs are going through. Offense is doing everything they need to. And hey, wouldn't you look at that? A flipping touchdown only to come out and just can't muster it up, man. They couldn't. They had the opportunity to, to, to punch their ticket to the playoffs. And boy, oh boy, did the Maulers eat them alive out there. See, this is this is usually what happens when a team loses the turnover battle, which they won the turnover battle last week. We talked about how do you get three turnovers and not pull out a win? Well, usually this is what the result is if you do give up such a massive amount. And really, I don't Josh Love, I man, I can't when he's hot, he's hot. I can't fully gauge how he is. And credit, second half Pittsburgh turned up the heat in terms of the pass rush. They definitely decided, you know, after they got that after Michigan went down got Cole Hicatini to get that touchdown. I think they just decided we're going to lock things up and kind of play our own ball once again. And really for, for the Panthers, it's feast or famine. It didn't feel like you'd see many intermediate routes that were kind of designed to go their way. It was a lot of, uh, it was more things that I'm hoping I get the downfield passing game going and that I can re- connect with my receivers and nothing was working that way. Uh, honestly, Reggie Corbin not being part of the rushing game. I think that's something that, was missed and I know that they haven't been as effective in that field this year but Corbin still is the heart and soul of that core uh he is the to me the better of those of the trio of running backs in this offense and I think that was sorely missed uh otherwise I mean Pittsburgh kudos hats off defense came and played and got a crucial win when needed they showed up Mm -hmm. it's a simple fact you know all they had to do was play a little bit better and they did play just a bit better. And defense has been winning them games for the most part all year round. Pittsburgh just has to muster a few decent drives to get some points on the board or get their defense to capitalize and give them good field position. That's what's been going. Because, I mean, if you look at you look at Pittsburgh, you know, on the other side, sacks just as poor on the opposite side. Trey, it's not like Troy Williams was having an easy day sitting in the back of the pocket hoping that he could get whatever he wanted. But he got just enough time. Mm-hmm. Still get just enough. He would get harassed often, you know, would still get knocked down a lot. But the thing is, you got to give him just enough time between the six sacks he took to get him to move down the field. And 19 points, they put it up, and it's part because they were able to do that and rely on a defense that does lay its claim as one of, if not the best in the league. Because we'll talk about another one that I think this week is trying to outbully the other if you catch my drift, mm-hmm. I think, in the north, um, without a doubt. But th- that's the deal. I mean... Pittsburgh showed up. They wanted it badly a bit more, I think. And it's the story of Michigan's year. It's just very confuddling. I know you you and I have had this back and forth all year uh, in about this and me getting frustrated or not. But I am, but it's because I am a legit fan of this Panthers mm-hmm. team. This is how I am with the Bears in the NFL. Right. You know, I do see the potential here. It's just that it doesn't get executed in the right areas. That defense, I'm serious. I know that they are good team wise, but if they really wanted to be mad at the other side of the ball, I wouldn't blame them because they've been let down a lot this year right. by that offensive unit at the worst possible times in those six losses. Yeah, I mean, and it showed up greatly last week. It's it's unfortunate because you you know it, it's what I thought with the Memphis uh, Showboats as well when they kicked off the season, they lost the first first three games. You're like, man. That's not, I want the hub teams to do well just to bring in the crowd. And I really hope that the Panthers can pull out a week, week 10. I'm going to be there. I'm going to bring there, bringing all of the hope, joy, enthusiasm 
that they might need to muster out a win. Uh, it didn't work. <laughs> it didn't work week three, but I'll try my darndest in week 10. Uh, needless to say, the league's already reported that they're going to be back in Detroit for season three. Um, are they a better or worse team than last year? I mean, the record says yes. They sometimes I, are and sometimes aren't, but I think maybe they can get a little bit of that consistency. I think there's probably some changes you need to make uh, somewhere, you know. Um, uh, well, I think it's. I think we have a lot of questions on. Honestly, I think it's a question on just how you operate the entire coaching and kind of personnel decision making, mm -hmm. if you will. That's going to be ma mainly evaluated. And to me, they are a better team. Defense was so in so many areas was lacking last mm -hmm. year to where they did a lot of stuff right. They brought in a lot of great talent at all three levels. You know, they have the league leading sacker in Breland Speaks off the edge right now. They have the league leading linebacker in tackles, actually league leader in tackles and in interceptions. He's tied right now at three mm -hmm. in Frank Ginda, who's elevated his game from last oh, sure. year. You know, they have, they have really good core of secondary players, in my opinion. They, so yeah, they're better. It's just, I don't know why two years in a row with, you know, you have the same offensive coordinator, but different head coaches and we're seeing the problems. I've seen a lot of people defend Eric Marty. Mm -hmm. I really have, but I will throw in my hat and say, can we maybe lay a little bit on Eric Marty for some of the stuff? I, I'm not saying it's everything, but there are times I watch some of the play calls and I go, why is this happening? Or some of the personnel decisions with, you know, I go back a few weeks to that failed, to that failed knee down. Mm -hmm. And that does come down to both the coordinator and the head coach. Right. So I'm just saying it's not everything, but I do think we have to look at that specific side next year. They're going to have personnel decisions and credit their season's still not over. They can still win, but like whatever happens, this is an imperfect team. You just hope that they have enough to muster a win and get over a curse at home this year. Yeah. I mean, I hope so. I want to see it. I want to see a win. Um, I don't know what I'm going to wear to the game. I'm, you know, maybe I'll root for the stars, Zach. Maybe that's what we need here. So I gonna, got that cook play, jersey. going to play the opposite effect we'll here. We'll see. We'll see what happens. I don't know. I don't know if anything can be a good old Ford Field curse, a Detroit curse. I mean, Detroit... The things I could say about Detroit. I love Detroit, Zach. Have I told you how much I love Detroit? Oh, I know you. I know you love your hometown. And, but you know what? You, you love it dearly. You know, a part of me loves it because it's like, it's like an abuser. It hurts me. It breaks me down. It takes me down okay. a peg and puts me in my place a little bit. And so every time I go to Detroit, I love it. There's nostalgia. God, there's a little piece of me that just gets... you get. You get a little hit on the sh on the shoulder, like nice and rough, not too hard. That says, "Don't remember where you came yeah. from, bud," and that's how it sends oh, you it's, off. It's it's <laughs> it's the greatest and the worst feeling at the same time. So all I can ask for is a good old Panthers win, which would, well, we'll talk about, but essentially send them to the playoffs. Now I don't know. I, we'll see. We'll 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 get to all that later. Um, Overall, I really, I expected maybe the Panthers would show up a little bit bigger. I think you brought up, you know, Reggie Corbin, Corbin being out kind of hurt them a little bit, but I mean, there is no excuse for four interceptions and allowing your quarterback to take eight sacks. Yeah, There's I'll, just, I'll still give more credit to the Maulers just to round out and give them that. So it's not like bro, we're yeah, talking yeah. About why did, why did Michigan let us down? No, P Pittsburgh all Dude, they day. showed I mean, up. They, Absolutely. And I, you can't, I mean, you have four, you have multiple <laughs> fours plus set you have four sacks. Mm -hmm. You have four interceptions and a block punt, a fifth one that wasn't called, which I'm only, re I'm referencing it from the fact they made a fantastic social edit or social media edit on their defensive, uh, successes mm -hmm. this week in, yeah, you can't take that away from them. They're, they're also an imperfect team on offense, but really it's because of one element. They have a weak offensive line, like really, if they had a little bit better pass protection or figured out how they could adjust their pass scheme, much like how Philadelphia has for the most part this mm -hmm. year coming down the stretch, they really would be a better team and probably finish a few of these games that they let slip away. Right. So fun, fun times ahead, but they're, they're definitely still right in the thick of it. Everyone is of course, but they feel way more 
in the thick of it and hungrier. I think to prove people wrong about last year's one one and nine or yeah, one yeah. nine squad that finished the season. So fascinating stuff going in ahead. Uh, next game up, though, I'll do this to move down yeah. the stretch, and so we can get any more or less Michigan. Yeah, 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 I feel bad for some folks, but here's the thing: Breakers showboats, and this was an awkward one. Not only, I mean, look, it was a blowout, of course. New Orleans talk about showing up to play, and they did. But man, you do you do kind of feel bad given the fact that it wasn't even in the end of the first half, and we've got lightning storms out there yeah. that basically kills the vibe of this one. And sure, there are some people that I give credit. They're like, "Ooh, is this the moment where you know Memphis kind of reflects on like how you know San Francisco back did back yep. in the day against Baltimore in the Super Bowl in the, in the Superdome, where you know the lights go out, they come out, and they go they start swinging, and it wasn't nope. it." And I. I I think you got the vibe of that. Of that, you have a bad start from Cole Kelly with poor choices all around, and a Breakers team that defensively. But it's funny you have back-to-back games. We're talking; they show up to play because really Memphis they did their all. Honestly, same deal. Where I'm looking at my my other side of the ball, I'm going, dude, what do we got to do to help you? Because mm-hmm. I mean, you look at MBT through 88 yards yeah. in this one. You didn't have to do much. Mm-hmm. They. They did everything they needed on defense and through some and through oh, special their teams defense in a way. was on another planet, dude. Yeah. Their defense was on another world. Uh yeah, honestly, this was uh this was a little bit of a shocker to me. I thought the showboats were going to come out swinging. We had saw them. I mean, I mean, they had a five-game win streak coming into this game and then played like they they looked like they were in the early season. And I would say that the rain delay maybe was a part of that, but we were already, I think it was what, 17 to nothing before the game went out. And seven, yeah, it was 17 3, and they threw the delay up. It was mid second quarter. It, we didn't feel close. Right. Like, uh, really, they they shot out like a cannon, and they just coasted good defense for the rest of the day. Memphis was never in it. And it's so strange. I know that some folks, when you talk about long win, win streaks, you wonder when they run out of gas, but. It's like it's the worst possible time. In credit, you get you get back out there. Most of your a lot of your fan base has gone home because of you know the rain and weather, and they're going to get promised to come the next day to watch Houston and Birmingham. But man, you feel bad because it's like there was a good crowd out there to start. You have your home base behind you. You're rallying to a five game win streak. You can get a six one if you sweep New Orleans, mm-hmm. and you take a bad loss here. And we'll discuss how why this is a compounding very bad loss because yeah they're five and four but they really it feels like they almost they are borderline ko'd their own chances of getting to the playoffs oh, yeah. with this performance yeah i mean well, well we could talk about the odds later but i mean let's actually no let's bring it up now we have it in the notes now our good boy luke miller from usfl newsroom you all know who lukey boy is i mean yeah. he started looking at the numbers started looking at the stats and he started breaking down what the showboats need to do here in week 10 Cause there is a chance, you know, the meme. So you're saying there's a chance and I mean, there is, there is a chance, uh, but they have a big point differential ahead of them. Essentially they need to score 63 more points than new Orleans this week. Oof. Oof. I mean, <laughs> maybe, maybe, uh, we haven't seen it in the USFL yet, old or new. Um, but you know what, what a hell of a show it will be. <laughs> what a hell of a show it would be i mean i'll, I'll give them i'll give them that they'll come out and try and go swinging mm. but i mean that's that's the deal you talk about look they lost 31 to 3 this contest and then you you think back this year what what else has gone wrong oh crud that uh 42 to 2 matchup mm. in week two thinking all the way back that's a big differential to yep. come up with and yeah they've won solid games in that five game win streak but they haven't been really blowouts. They've, they've been somewhat close. I know the Michigan contest, they did kind of rally the troops and got a two-score win on that, but they've kind of had to get one-score wins down the stretch. And if you are in a tiebreaker scenario and it has to come down to points, that is the worst-case scenario you want is if you are in the negative, in the red. Right. Given New Orleans, who has been very much they outpaced people to start the year and have kept games close. Houston's been pretty close on their contest. And it's you usually don't think about right, that. Right, you know, right. You're not a team. You're not thinking point differential, but in the worst possible moment that might, and feels like it could will be 
what KOs your season. Very much so. After a five game win streak. Which is a shame. That's what's the damn shame. Well, yeah. And I mean, if they would, and that's the thing, if they would have won one of those games, the point differential might not even matter. One of those games earlier in the season. That, that three game losing streak to start the season doomed them. And like you mentioned, having that 42 to two or even this 31 to three, you know, when it comes to the tiebreakers, which we'll talk about later as well isn't doing them any favors uh i'd say you know it, i'm i'm happy that they turned out the way they did though i mean they mm-hmm. for those five games they look like a completely different team as a showboats fan people living in memphis i mean you bring cole kelly back next year from the start of the season i think you make the postseason at least you have a yeah, good well, chance and if anything like look they're still gonna fight it out they still have an outside shot mm-hmm. It's just going to be really hard. I mean, look, I'm looking at the differentials right now, and New Orleans, you know, you look at you look at that. I mean, 220 to 174, you know, that's what you have to compete, compete with after the split. You know, gamblers have a much better one. Showboats have a negative 16 to compete with still. It's, it's tough, you know. Mm-hmm. The, I mean, the other way I've seen it, you know, Luke laid out another one that could work here. Michigan wins. Houston wins by 26 and then Memphis wins by 37, which, you know, a little more convenient or a little more convenient for them. But it's just, it's harder to say right. it's been the longer you go into a season with spring ball, the more competitive it gets <clears throat> blowouts. Don't they usually don't happen, which is why this is also surprising was given the fact that this was a blowout as well. Mm-hmm. You know, the showboats offense hasn't been like the world beaters of the league, but they haven't been, downtrodden and saying that Cole Kelly and company have basically let them down. And for the most part, that really is what happened. Right. They, they really, that side of the ball, let them down on Saturday. Mm-hmm. And, you know, New Orleans had kind of an awkward day offensively, but they just let their, they just got the job done. Right. That's the thing. They got to win. They put themselves in the best possible driver's seat to get a third matchup with their bitter rival in Birmingham to try and get a rematch and to go and say, ha, gotcha this year. Well, you brought up a good uh, 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 word that I'll repeat again here. You so blow out, blow out. And this is coming off of, you know, not this week in particular, but leading up to this week, we had 10 consecutive games within one possession. And this week, other than the last game, which boy, oh boy, we'll get to shortly. This week threw that all out the window, right? Decisive victories to start the yeah. week. So yeah, yeah. very, very different. Um, you can lead in. I know it's not as pleasant for you. We're both on the losers column this week. But honestly, Which? it's this one felt like it really did swing because of one of the goofier. This is one of the goofiest plays I've seen in a while. I mean, credit Birmingham's offense got hot second mm-hmm. half. They figured themselves out. And as Skip Holt said, you're ready to wake up. And they did. But I mean, dude, Kenji Bahar, that that fumble right into the arm. I know. Sealed the deal. I know. That that was that was the KO. That was the final punch. You know, at a certain point, ref's law had to be broken, but can we just sit back and be amazed that ref's law was a thing for eight weeks of this season? It's almost like the speculation zone. Once speculation, now confirmation. (laughs) <laughs> pat myself on the back you know sign us up there will refs law continue in week 10 i don't know i don't want it i hope maybe it's a, a inverse of the breaking of refs law next week where we both win we both lose this week and then we wouldn't that be poetry i would wouldn't that be poetic with you being in attendance Ooh. i would be thrilled if that was not what happens given the track record of you being in detroit but for the final bl- for the final thing, at least until it returns, I will I will serenade with with this. I will remember <laughs> you. <laughs> you will remember. God, you me. better hope we both don't make the playoffs because we're gonna really hate each other. Because there is, I mean, there's a chance. There's a chance. But boy, the the stallions the stallions are just so hungry to get back to that championship. Alex Magoo, we talked about it last week. It was kind of a battle between Alex Magoo uh, and Mark Thompson. And, man, I mean, Alex Magoo is making a pretty good case for himself being the MVP this year, which 
I kind of love, right? You know, I think there was a lot of people that discounted him last year because they got injured early. Jamar came in and just balled out. And we almost got Uno reverse card of last year where Jamar came in. Don't forget, came out and threw a bomb touchdown right away in that game. Yep. But unfortunately gets injured only to have Alex Magoo come in and start balling out. I mean, and a kudos to Skip Holtz for, I mean, he's got an eye for talent. That team is flipping stacked. Uh, was I sad that I lost? Yeah. Am I sad that I lost to the Stallions? A little bit yet less. So, you know, it's funny. The Stallions fans hate me be- for all the <laughs> obvious reasons because generally the gamblers just, you know, the Stallions can't, they can't deal with the ga- good old gambler. They don't know how to buck them. And it's okay. Everybody has their weakness, and it's the gamblers for the Stallions boys. But, man, this weekend they were coming in hot. That game ended. I purposely didn't post on Twitter because everybody's like, where are you at, ref? Where are you at, ref? Where'd you go? I I don't hear you talking anymore. You had so many asking, but that's that's the reputation you built for yourself. Oh, no, they built it. for the. I don't make the laws. I don't write them. I just call them as I see them. And ref's law, you can't admit, you got to admit I was right on that. Eight weeks, that's at minimum 80% of the season. I got it there. Now, this was not the week that I wanted to see ref's law broken, but we still have another week. And actually, I hope it's broken next. I hope we get like the perfect uh, equalness out of this. Uh, I don't know. There's probably a better word for that. The best parody of this where, again, eight weeks, it's one or the other. Week nine, we both lose. Week 10, we both, win, we both win. And hopefully go in. And we're one step away to Ooh. reenacting the grudge game. Man, grudge gauge, grudge game at the champy. Oof, that's going to get me for, all For now, good. I, Birmingham, I, I'm with you. Kudos to both Skip Holtz and John Chavis for sticking to it because it's not just Holtz's side that's been – I think trying to identify what they want to be given the injuries they that they had week one. But Chavis's group has had to kind of work its way around and kind of fit in pieces as they go. Polling was an example mm-hmm. of that. Two-time defensive player of the week. He's been a plug and play ever since they've gotten him in the roster to help kind of buoy that linebacking core. He's been a great piece that they've added in in terms of valuing. Zach Potter I'll throw in for getting – talent re- requisition in that can help kind of churn in stuff. Marlon Williams, they lost too, but they've been finding guys and getting consistently used to what the receiving core has available. Now, you know, Davion Davis is now regular. Jace Sternberger is the leader in touchdown receptions this year. Dion Kane, who's more of a specialty player. He's getting more reps because they've been getting more comfortable as the years gone on. And those are guys that, you know, last year we were talking completely different, you mm. know, this receiving core, Marlon Williams was the guy from last year that was the returning person that you knew and he's out and they had to go with all new cast that are saying, okay, here's Magoo. He's your starter again this time around looking full season. Mm -hmm. As long as he's in now, you got to get used to him. And they finally start. They've fully besides Sternberger. Everyone now is seeming to be in sync. They just got to start fast Mm -hmm. because that's the only thing that's been killing them is that they get in their own way. That pitch to CJ Marable. Now i I first reaction went, how do you not get grab that CJ? Because CJ is a good running back. He's been doing a great job turning over his own game and getting back into what his rhythm was before Bo Scarborough joined last year midseason. And he didn't get it. But then you look at it, missed up, messed up on the pitch. Later on, everything gets stable. But it's like it's like Skip says, you gotta wake up, you know. And that that will burn you against teams like a New Orleans mm-hmm. if you give them an able. Even Houston again if they have to play him again. You right. know, Memphis they could, but they get a little less. But none, nonetheless, the, the Birmingham Stallions I think have shown this game in particular showed that they have come full circle, found all the pieces, and have worked through all mm-hmm. of the constraints, and they're getting healthy at the right time. Practice video Scooby Wright being in pads is again showing up. He's he was expected to come back this week. I know there's that petition to bring him back early. League was going by its protocols for IR, but he's back and they're getting healthy at the right time. Once again, seven and two mm-hmm. could be eight and two by the end of the week. Possibly hope not even seven and three. That still is a good season. Given all the changeover, all the circumstances, oh, sure. they could still be right there. Ending the season. Once again, being South champs mm-hmm. 
And you got to get preps to that staff that has kept them up and running and adapting as they go in a more competitive South division than they had last in year. A, yeah. That, that too. I mean the South, like the, the entire league has been much more constrained and closer than ever than last year was mm. like, think about this last year, like playoffs. We were, we were like sitting here week 10 going, uh, everything's decided it's the toilet we're just bowl. playing to play. You know, we're, yeah, we were talking about, we were talking about the number one overall pick that, that situation doesn't really arise this year because everyone's playing, right. but you know, we were talking about a freaking toilet bowl, the tank bowl, as we were also referencing mm-hmm. it too. Now, you know, they're the only team that's got a playoff clincher and they were ones that had to adapt the most to one of the most injuries this right. year. Interesting. That's a good job by a coaching staff. That that is really something you got to point you out. You gotta love Skip great Holtz. Job. I mean, he's a great person on the sidelines, but Zach, we gotta admit, he's a great person off off of the sidelines. He's oh, he one of my too. favorite people. Person. Every time we bu- run into him, he's the funniest guy. He's the most genuine guy. And I'll even throw back to earlier this season when the cowgirl's cowgirl hat, whatever you want to call it, flew off of her head when she was riding the stallion out to the game. First thing he does, he goes and picks it up. What a gentleman. And you do know his son's about to go play here in Houston for the Cougars. That's right. I'm getting signed up on that. I'm a Holtz yeah, fanboy. I'm a Holtz stan. You have to go, su- go support. I mean, look, this is how I look at it. If 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 you had to keep one coach in the league in terms of like set, and this is hypothetical, none of this is real. Don't don't take this clip out of context and be, oh my God, they're firing all these coaches. No. Um if you had to fire seven coaches and keep one, and this would be tough for me because I also like Mike Riley, even though you switched the quarterbacks up on me, Mike, I I would pick Skip. Yeah. Because I, I think he is the I think he is the ideal image of what the USFL wants. Curtis Johnston fits that a lot of these guys do. I just skip to me, we've met him more often mm-hmm. and he's been great nonetheless. Like perfect spring football coach. Mm-hmm. Like the ideal person you want in the USFL and kind of the staple. So good so far for the season. He's still got some work to do, but definitely got the job done. And Curtis Johnson, I mean, kudos to him this year too, coming in short term. Oh yeah. Like he did five and four squad, even with the loss here this week, there's still a damn good football team. Really. If I'm looking at the gamblers though, this is what's been missing for me before we move on mm-hmm. and finish with Philadelphia, New Jersey and that heavyweight matchup that really great primetime TV. Oh yeah. That, that was, but I mean, if I'm Houston, I, I want to know what happened to the passing game spark, you know, and it could be because I don't know if it's because of a lingering Kenji Bahar injury or not, or maybe it's because Mark Thompson's here and they're like, well, we got a offensive player of the year, Cal running back on our side. So we don't have to really as much lean. And I know Johnson had mentioned 51 49 is the pass run split mm-hmm. or 51 run 49 pass, but they weren't doing that to begin the year. Right. And I do wonder if maybe because they got away with that, that Kenji Bahar's confidence that he had, especially when he went into play Memphis and during that stretch where they were looking like the best team in the yeah. league. I wonder if they just killed it because they started running. Like I, I think that that is crucial. He was getting hot mm-hmm. and on a hot streak before they had to step out and have Terry Wilson and Montel Cozart step in for that stallions game. He hasn't been the same oh, since. No. And I oh, wonder no. if it's because they've had to lean on Mark and they went, we're going with Mark first. We don't have to worry as much about I, you. You know, no, not as much pressure on you. I could see it being you know? a little bit of both, to be quite honest with you, right? Where, you know, part of it is, yeah, they're stepping away from the pass play. But he, like you mentioned, I mean, he's coming off of an injury. Um, some of, you know, even the most minor injury can throw you off your rhythm. I mean, I know we're not, it's not the same sport, but golf, man, there's guys that will swear that they lost their swing and they will have to practice it gauge it back in only to get that swing again. And football is very similar. I mean, throwing a football boy. I mean, there's some accuracy to that one inch too far, one inch too short and the play is dead, right? You have to be right on the spot and your receivers as well. Um, Am I scared? No. Do we have a chance to make the playoffs? Yes. Do we have a good chance to make, make the playoffs? I think so. But you know what? Before we get to that, we have one more game, USFL After Dark. And boy, oh 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 boy. Does USFL After Dark always flip and deliver? It it does. It it does really deliver. And Philadelphia, two times this year, has had to go through games like this, have the split difference with each Mm -hmm. one. 
but they, it's for fun football. You know, I, I it, this was in prime time on Fox. The ratings were fantastic for it. Nine hundred and three and three K. Really good game for any spring sure. league game in this in this time of frame right now, and it makes you wonder. Like this total sidetrack from before we get into the game, you know, for next year's scheduling. You know, it's it's kind of hard because the USFL is still trying to establish itself on both networks, so it doesn't always get the preferential treatment. Sure. Fox, it might do it once in a while because it's Fox and they own it, but like you still have to balance it, given that you have other bigger contracts to deal with. Right. But I'm telling you, man, you look at that 903K primetime game, and if you're Fox next year, this is me thinking ahead. You know, we've talked about, like, TV media rights talks and all that. But I'm looking at that game for, like, more data. I'm like, man, if we can find a way to get a few more of those night primetime games, like, same with, like, how NBC had that banger early in the year. And credit, that was a Mm lead-in from the Kentucky Derby. But still, it was like it was a primetime game. You know? You look at those dads, I'm like, man, we can get some more prime times, like 7 o'clock Eastern on a Sunday or like 7 or 6 o'clock on a Saturday. Man, we could get some good ratings. Oh, yeah. And that's where I'm like looking at that. You can sell that too. And that looks great for ad buyers, by the way. If you're like, hey, these games, you know, what if we, hey, we stick around, we get more preferential treatment, you're getting more eyeballs, you know. And I mean. So that, that was nice. I, I love to see that. And after dark, it's been paying oh, off, yeah. like. It gets people buzzing. Like that was the that was some of the most talk I've seen for the league all year. Was that contest where you're coming down to the wire and going, "Oh my God, is Philadelphia going to pull it off?" I know, like, dude, what a comeback, you know. right? Potentially, uh, but dude, the Generals. Where was this Generals team all year? I mean, I, USFL. I'll tell you where they were. At. Well, USFL comps. They put out a little bit of a note, and they they were actually it was a very good point where if you look at all of their past games, all of these losses, it was like three, three, six, nine, three, three. They lost a lot of these games very close, but I know what you're going to say. I already know it. Go ahead and say it. It's because, and and some people might disagree, but to me, it's because you played around too much with who's behind center. Mm. I know that they lost even with DeAndre Johnson, but I'm telling you, the best quarterback on that general's roster is number one. Numero uno should have been behind there, and he did get knocked out for a week. Okay, but there were weeks like Kyle Oletta played the entire game against Houston earlier this I year. I love it. A six point game. Can you imagine if DeAndre was in, how much more volatile that offense is mm. if he's in behind center? This is a player you don't mess around if you're playing professional football. Mm. You put him in, you start him. He is a versatile two way quarterback. He can deliver this offense. He was he's been in this offense two years. Right. And I think I saw last that that past weekend what you saw. That is the general squad from last year that when I was coming in this season, I said, that's gonna be scary. DeAndre Johnson with a full year ahead of him with no Luis Perez to take his time. Mm-hmm. It's gonna be a fun team. And I didn't predict Mike Riley deciding I'm gonna just rotate like crazy. And not give my two-year quarterback the preferential treatment because he knows the offense more. But it happened. Mm-hmm. And now they finally got to the point where they're like, okay, he's healthy. It's go time. We got to put our best guy in. Right. They did. And it got a little iffy at the end, credit. But for three and quarters and change, it was the DeAndre John. It was the trio show oh, yeah. from last year. DJ, Vic, Darius Victor, and Trey Williams. The big trio that carried them so many times. Mm-hmm in that first half of the season is what got them that win for the most part and a good defensive stand in the final few minutes to keep them at bay. This is what kills me right. the entire year because I saw that game and I'm going, imagine if he doesn't get, and I could say a different word here, screwed around <laughs> for so many weeks. He has been a team player and I got to give him praise for that. He has been a good soldier, mm-hmm. pun fully intended for a general squad. But my God, you should have been playing him the entire time, every game. If he's healthy, you play DJ. Yeah. And that's why for folks, they're saying, well, it's a two QB system. No, it should be his system. He was the guy all along. Why were you making these weird choices? And to me, I still stand by it. It's because Mike Riley is trying to get back to the game and give these guys tape. And I respect that. But at the same time, I'm a fan that wants to see a pro team go play to win the game, like Al Davis used to say. Right. 
Right, right. And DJ gives you that way to win the damn game. Right. So now they're going to play him. They've got their shot, but now they got to play the best defense in the league that's not theirs in the general. Which to do it, man. I week ten is going to be so fun. But before we get there, the stars. I mean, they got to be kicking themselves. They, but I mean, you can't blame them. They put up one hell of a battle to almost come up with the twenty pl- point. Uh, 20 plus point comeback when well, ends did. up 37 to 33. They were right on the edge there. Like you said, they had that defensive stand. Uh, the, uh, you know, the Jersey defense put them in that position as well. I mean, they, they gave up all those points. It looked like this game was going to be a blowout. And I was talking to a couple of my friends that watched the league. And I said, you know what? Never count out a fourth quarter in the USFL. Anything can happen. And we watched it kind of ha- come to fruition. And I said, look, at this look at this amazing game i mean for even a quick second it looked like there might it might go to overtime had they gone for a field goal instead of a touchdown this may have gone into overtime at 33 33 which we were so close man i I wanted ot so bad man but like that that false start that they had on that fourth and ten yeah it still would have been a stretch but that really sealed the deal because i get i i agree with clatton company like when they were talking about it on the play because you have that on side on in your pocket. Right. You can kick that field goal. Luis Aguiar is the most accurate kicker in the league. You nail it. You get another shot with more space. You still have a minute plus. Mm-hmm. And I got it. But man, I was hoping so bad this would be an OT game right. on primetime television. Oh, sure. Just for the game that it was, it's just such a hot competition for the North. But you know what? At the end of the day, the Stars, they still have a chance to be the le- uh, the leaders in the division coming next week, pending a win. Uh, but they lost out on their chance to have that a week early and kind of rest going into the playoffs, Indeed. which has to sting just a little bit. Uh, and, I mean, this might be next week will determine, or the, not even next week, this upcoming weekend this will week. determine if this is the first year that we see the Stars not in the USFL championship or playoffs in general weird still to think that but that is the that is the world we live in right now is that that might happen and i'll tell you what man if you look case cook has already proved himself a year plus in this league dude balled out and basically gave it his all i mean he got banged up and bruised he was he was really gunslinging it for that final quarter to all of what he could do Mm. 263 yards and all three touchdowns man was on a tear until that final two, until that final drive in a in a series, when you talk about it, where they have to go take the field goal and then try again on the onside. But here's what the kicker is, and it's it's I'm getting flashbacks to the end of last year, because you noticed how much he was getting hurt at the end. Mm. You know how much he is holding his himself. He's getting beat up and bruised. He's the most sacked quarterback in the league. Oh yeah, he is getting banged up once more. This is the same song and dance from the end of last season right. because he doesn't have enough time. They've done so much better. They were on a, they were on a much worse sack streak midway through the oh, year, yeah. and they have cleaned a ton up. Which was similar to last year. Uh, yeah. But, yeah, I mean, he's Case Cook he's still taking way too got many hits. that dog in him. There is nothing that will stop him. But, you know, I mean, it does get s- scary to see him getting ragdolled out there a little bit every now and then. They took him to the tent. He came back out. He was good to go. And that's what you want to see. But man, you, if you want to win that championship, you got to keep your dude safe. Right. And so, I mean, it might be a little bit too li- uh, late this year to kind of get that offensive line a little bit more stacked up, but you got to hope season three, they focus on that a little bit more. Well, the, yeah, certainly if cook is, is back next year, which again, well, whoever's he's back, playing, I mean, you gotta keep that guy. Well, yeah, safe. I know. I know whoever's back, but like, nonetheless, I mean, that's linemen are so hard to come right, by right, at right. this level. And you got, again, you got two main leagues fighting for, for good linemen on both sides of the ball. So that's rough. Yeah. You know, if cook is, like I said, if cook is, does come back again, like I would be, that's the first thing I go to my, to my staff and be like, Hey, <laughs> Can I, is there any way we can double down right. on like everything we were working well to start the year or the end of the year and go into that? Cause it's funny. They've like repeated the exact same mistakes from the beginning of last season where it's like, Oh, we're taking all these hits. Like Brian Scott, Brian Scott, when he was with the stars, like 
that beginning of the season. Part of the reason he got knocked out, he got hit a lot mm-hmm. first half of oh, the yeah. year. And then it led to Case Cook is coming in. And then Case got knocked, got beaten up, bruised, and then eventually broke his leg and got knocked out in the championship game of what could have been at that point. And now you see a whole season of him taking this beating where they took a half of a season, most of the sacks came at the beginning of the year, and now they're like, oh, now we'll course correct. Why are you doing this again? Right. Right. Did you not learn your lesson from last year? And that's where you're hoping for year three. But nonetheless, like if you're Philadelphia, you know, you have everything gelling right now. I think for the weapons you've got defensively, be a little, be a little, uh, concerned in terms of like full game effort or so the last two contests, but you know, got, if you can calm it down, you play it some good games when you're ch- waiting, your playoff game. And then you, you need that one chance just like last year. Remember, they were down and out in the North North <laughs> Championship last season. Mm-hmm. You're there. But, man, the bigger story really, I think, is New Jersey just because of that, of that Jesus, it finally showed right. up type of moment for me. You know, good deal. For sure. Defensively, too. Great end of the game, by the way. Uh, here, here, Matafa, my God. Excellent strip sack to end that game. Uh, he's one of the top. He's one of the top guys in uh, pass rushing this year for the Generals, and he's been one of the leaders on that squad. So, uh, hell of a finish, hell of a contest. League's got to be happy to see that one because that's showing off. You know, just it's the best way to show off in prime time your game and the and a lot of people loved mm-hmm. it. Like that's main thing. Some comments on the drones. I did uh, see there's that, always but, somebody you know, and there's always something, and I get it. Not everybody likes the drones. You know who did like the game? Nova, my dog, who is, I, I'm sure everyone oh, else. Yeah. Says she, our little, our little guest she, in the uh, background. She, was, she actually came. She, oh, there she is. Did you want to get back on the podcast again, you little puppy? Oh. She's get out of here. <laughs> anyway, she ain't going nowhere. She usually, I'll, no lie. She's usually like right under here where she takes up my foot space. So she's, she wanted to get some camera time today. She knew it's going to be a lot of eyes on this show. It's the final week of the regular season <clears throat> making her debut appearance maybe not debut i don't know she probably snuck in the camera so, before so, she she did well to start start out she's just chiming in to why new jersey also should have started dj <laughs> deandre johnson more during the during the year uh but no good good wrap up a great way to end week nine um i think it, it's just a perfect setup for week right nine, like if anything and then i think a lot of people were hoping that this year we were going to see much more playoff tensions. I know there's been some folks and I actually want to talk about this right now where we've had between both the spring leagues this year, the talk of, Oh God, we're going to have a four and six squad in the playoffs. And I'll say this. And why didn't we mix up the divisions? Right, right. And I'll say the same thing I said, like with the XFL one, when people were bringing that up, it's like, you don't know how these teams are going to be at the beginning of the year. So first off that you like, that's the first thing. Mm. How, how do you know? Right, right, right. You know, like, you, you know, you're, you're commenting because it's week 10 or week or the playoffs and you're disappointed because it did come to this. Like, here's the deal. Play teams just need to play better. Right. You know, like I could look at Pittsburgh, for example, you know, how many times this year, Pittsburgh's kind of been like close, but no cigar. And they could easily be like a six and three, five and four squad right mm-hmm. now. That's the type of All season right. we've had right, right. with a lot of these games. So come on. Come on. And I mean, it's you a know, short season and it's a short run rate runway to the season. You'll say, I'll say this, the records may not show it, but I'd say much get better gameplay season two than season one. I mean, case in point, we're competitive going into week 10, right? It'd be one thing if it was like one, four and six team and every other, the rest of the teams were just stacked. But this is like, you look at the South or uh, the North rather, I mean, we got gridlock all over everywhere you see. It's gridlock up in the north. So it is what it is. Uh, but I will, I will, I won't guarantee it, but I'll stiferentee it. I think we're going to have good football from here until the championship. And the proof is in the pudding on what we've seen so far this year. A record is a record. But like I said, with a 10 game season, I mean, it's kind of expected that you might see that, right? Yeah. Oh, without a doubt. You were definitely, I, I think we were. And we, we knew the, I think you and I had, had confidence to where we could say we knew it was going to be better across the board and it's lived up. Right. Like I said, the standings are gridlocked. It's much better across the board. I mean, we're talking about the Maulers being one good game away from doing a complete 180 mm-hmm. on us. You want to, you can complain about record all you want, but they have done their job and they have played much better this oh, yeah. year. 
Like that's all you got to say, you know, records don't matter when you are one game away from a playoff and then one game away from getting your shot at being put in USFL history. So that's where we're at right now. It's pretty awesome. Uh, I'm stoked to talk about that on the other side. Um, before we do that though, we do get to kind of get a preview and I guess to talk about the Panthers coming game, uh, with one of their star corners, Levante Taylor. I got to sit down with him this week to chat about that, about, uh, his story coming into pro football, because, uh, fun fact, he was a very, he was very highly recruited going into FSU. Um, things didn't fully go his way, but he's making the best of it. And he is proving himself right now in the USFL. And, uh, he knows the importance of this game in Detroit coming up in week 10 and has been highlighting some of the key players on this Panthers squad. Take a listen to this interview and this conversation. We'll catch you on the other side. Welcome everybody into the latest edition of the USFL podcast interview series, bringing you the latest from players, coaches, and personalities from around the United States football league. Joining me today is a player that has been having quite the season might not show on the stat sheet, but trust me, he has been showing up as locking things down on his side of the field. And he's playing on my team this week that needs to get a win to get into the playoffs. We'll be touching on all of that and some of the story of his career journey here as well with defensive back Levante Taylor from the Michigan Panthers joining me on this edition of this interview series. Uh, Levante, hey, thanks for uh, t- thanks for jumping on. Uh, appreciate you reaching out to jump on the show too because, I mean, I'll be sure. honest with you, you know, for in terms of how the season's gone, you know, I think you've been kind of show- showing, hey, like I've been – Locking down, I've been showing off my side, I've been showing my speed, and you know, the more of me and the ref look into this, you know, you kind of do play on a bit of an island. Not giving a little bit of praise, of course, to start the show. Maybe not ideal for a week of getting the team built, but just saying, you know, notice, noticing doesn't really people don't seem to throw your way. You kind of notice that yourself, or how's this uh, been for you this year, like that? Yeah, so. <clears throat> um, first of all, I want to uh, thank you for uh, ha- having me on this show. Um, I want to thank the USFL for bringing me in. Uh, Coach Nolan, um, Coach Steve Brown, and Steve Kayser, our um, GM on the team, for bringing me in to be able to uh, showcase my talent here. Uh, and the season has been, a, um, you know, it's been a, a up and down moments. Uh, you know, we started off hot, two and zero, and then we I think, then we lost four straight, one then lost. Um, but you know. Um, it's just a blessing in disguise, man, because now we're here for this last game and it's, it's one to go home. We couldn't ask for a better placement, matchup, wherever, whoever, wherever. It's one to go home, man. And it just so happened that the di- division, it fell how it fell. And shoot, at the end of the day, I know everybody's happy and everybody's ready to go play. Um, so, yeah, this season has been, it's been fun, man. It's been like a roller coaster ride every week. I think for the Panthers fans, me being one of them, as much as I sometimes on the show act like I'm, I'm not at times. It is definitely a roller coaster for for me because I see the talent on this ro- on <clears throat> on your guys's roster, and I go, man, it's been up and down, left and right, you name it. But here you are, right at the end. The North Division's just been that chaotic all across the board. If you look at this, and you know, it's really anyone's game. You know, I. I do want to, I guess we'll just touch right into this right now. I mean, yeah. how, how do you look at the North division? Because, I mean, I think the big conversation around the league for a lot of folks is, you know, oh, the South's 13-3. and three. They beat down on the North division teams, you know. But the yeah. North's been pretty competitive, even though it's, you know, it, the, the records, you can argue, don't show. It still has been fun football, whether it's Correct. been playing against interdivisional or in-division games. Right. Yeah, so our division, I know everybody talking about the records, but sometimes you can't look at the record. It's every different sports where somebody with a bad record go out there and beat a team with a good record. So if you look at our players, man, we have very competitive players on each team, great players. Man. I think the division is just is just good, man. Everybody got each other number right now. It's great players. Look at our division. We have the best defensive players in our division. Let's be real about it. Man. Come I mean, you got like, two, you got arguably two of them right now. You know, I, yeah, so, I know that you know uh, one team. I know that I know Pittsburgh's been saying their own rights on that. New Jersey. Right. It's actually funny in terms of the defensive player of the year award. The North kind of has that. Almost feels like That's it's what I'm locked we in. We got that. We got yeah. We got every man from DBs to linebackers to 
D line, man, I think we got the better the better of the defense on our division, to be honest. Um, not to take anything away from the South Division, they got great players as well. But I feel like sure. we got the upper hand upper hand on that. Um, but you know, like I said, our division is very competitive. Um the South is competitive too, but I just feel like we just have a, a different kind of edge on our side for some reason. It's just man, it's like, you know, on their side you have the clear cut one, obviously a clear cut two. And then, you know, teams that come on along. I feel like with our season in, in, in the north side, it's been like up and down. You're like, oh, man, oh, oh, you know what I'm saying? So I feel like our division, whoever, whoever wins in our division, I think is going to win the whole thing. Ooh, so you got – so you're telling me no matter what happens, you think the, the north division team is going to pull the big upset on whoever comes out of the yeah. south come July 1st? Yes, I do. Interesting. I'd be fascinated to see that one. And I, I mean, not no, and like, again, we've seen good quality play across the board. I mean, Philadelphia, Jesus, I mean, you, you know, yeah. this very well, imagine where they are compared to the beginning of the year. You know, you well, guys, it's exactly. been a roller coaster. You talked about that two Oh start. Now you guys are three and six, but you're still in the thick of it of all things. Um, you know, talking about, I guess, kind of how do you keep things together when it's been kind of this <clears throat> erratic year? I mean, four game losing right. streak, but it's at home. You know, not, that not only right. not only that you got that that lo- the loss streak like that, but you lose at home too. You know, and right. you're trying to get a you know you try and get a win for your fans. You know, I get right. that exactly. I feel like honestly, man, if just playing the game, and I know a lot of people here have been playing the game for a long time. It's just adversity you have to fight through. Not everything's going to go our way. We, we would like for it to go our way. We shoot went two and on the away, and we have four straight home games. Like, oh man, it's supposed to be like six and zero, easy. You know what I'm saying? But yeah, yeah. You know, unfortunately, everything doesn't go as planned. Um, so you know, you just got to go back to the drawing board and try to fix those things up. And like I said earlier, it's just it's no better situation and story how this can you know how this can come along, man, with us playing this uh, play in playoff game basically. So. Man, it's, it's been a fun ride, man. I've been and enjoying every moment of it, you know. Just you know, just thankful for this opportunity. And I know everybody on our team is thankful for the opportunity too. And just ready to go out there and play and get this first home home win in front of the crowd and everybody. Man, it's Sunday night, seven p.m. We the last game. Everybody gonna be watching. Prime like, time, NFL, man. Yeah, I imagine you got a lot of people in Detroit across the fandom gonna be tuning in. I mean. Shoot, if it's anything like last weekend's primetime game with Jer- with New Jersey and Philadelphia, then uh, by all means, I'm going to be ready for the fireworks. Right. <laughs> I'm excited yeah. for that. Levante, I want to talk to you a bit here. You know, you talk about your opportunity, and honestly, you know, <clears throat> spring football, no matter what league you cut it, it's another opportunity for fo- for players to get that extra bit to get, not only either extend their careers, but also if they want to get that next level. And I mean – I did get to read this excellent piece in the athletic by uh Tashawn Reed that you that was about your FSU journey and just kind yeah. of how you went, you know, you're talking top tier rated star coming into college, having to kind of revamp yourself going out. I mean, how's that how was that yeah. experience and kind of just kind of coming in and saying, I gotta find my way or you know, yeah. readapt myself coming into the pro scene? Right. Um Honestly, I feel like anybody in my shoes, man. I mean, I, for me personally, just going through what I went through, man. I'm I'm just a fighter, man. You can't never give up on um, being a five star recruit, being number one cornerback in my uh, my class, uh, top five player in my class overall. Um, going to Florida State, um, I, I went to Florida State because I just it felt more comfortable. I felt more comfortable being there just just because I was able. Be just blessed to be able to play with those guys from the 2015 class. Um, I already met Derwin James before I got there. I, me and him was on the same uh, Nike opening team. Um, Josh Sweat is my god brother, and yeah. then, um, Derek Derek Nadi. I played with him at Ocean Lakes High School. Um, and then the other guys that were there, I already met them through through me just being at the 2015 camp. Even though I was a 2016 uh, graduate, uh, so I just feel like it was more comfortable with me. And they had a lot of DBs similar to my size who had. Um, much success in the uh, defensive scheme. Um, you know, and Jimbo Fisher, man, he's a great coach. Uh, man, it hurt, it hurt me. It hurt me bad when he left because you know everything changed, man. Like you know, like man, it was it was bad. And then you know, it is a big dip when you have a legend like him in the game. Half, I mean, yeah. different opportunity, of course, down the way. But I mean, you're yeah, that's a good point. Speaking from experience, I'd love to hear you know, keep on hearing about that. You know, in yeah. particular, that's. 
you know, culture change in, in college. I feel like that's a big one because, I mean, and you can you can tell me if you feel, but like getting recruited by someone who's not there anymore, now you're in a new system. Right. How, how does that how does that work <clears throat> when you're trying to adapt to someone that you weren't brought in, wasn't a guy right. that maybe brought you in, you know? Right. Uh, it's just everything changed. I, I went, we went from practicing from with, with Jimbo. We, I think we meetings started like 2 15 p.m. and then, you know, practice meetings, all that. Uh, when, the, when our new coach came in, man, everything just changed. We had morning practices, all type of everything just changed. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I adapt very well. Everything was the same for me. It's just that. I just you know everything just go downhill. You got players who who don't believe in the system. You got players that do believe in the system. And when you got wishy washy players, everything is not going to be. Everybody's not. And when everybody's not bought into the system, you know everything just goes downhill. And not only makes you look bad, it makes makes it yeah, it makes everybody look bad as well. So you know everybody's not on the same page. You know we man, it, it just went all bad, man. But you know I'm glad that the guys there they're having a great experience there because Florida State. I feel like they're going to be one of the top teams this year and for that college playoff run. So, man, I'm just happy for those guys. That, you know, they're back in that winning column. And I'm just uh, just happy they didn't have to experience what I, what I went through and what the players went through. Yeah, it's uh, definitely if you're in following the college scene, it's up and up right now. I mean, excellent finish to the year last year. Um, one of the top teams in the ACC looking like they could be – the top team right now in the ACC coming in next right. season. That's great to see. Alma Mater in particular, you got to be thrilled to see to see that as well. Um, during your time there, and this was something that was interesting. I bring up this p this piece uh, the Sean Re- that Sean Reed and you had with an interview discussion. Um, right. you had a stress fr- stress fracture in 2018. I mean, what what is that like to have that on have a stress <clears throat> fracture on your back? I I can't say yeah. I've had that experience. I've had a I've had a fractured leg like spiral right. fracture. And that was a while ago. That was extremely painful for me, but right. I can't say like stress fracture. How does, what does it feel like? How, how do you even know uh, that it's there? So, so to be real with you, I honestly, I didn't know it was there. What happened was, um, so we, I got, I think I, I got it. Yeah. I got it in camp the same going into playing in prior playing that Virginia tech game. Um, you know how camp is, you got campus from 6 a.m. to 11 since 11 p.m. at night every day into the season first game so it's his own grind from, <laughs> yeah so we go from meetings all the way up and we practice after practice we we a lift and me just being the competitive guy I, I still like to lift weights heavyweights we're in there competing and just from so basically from what the doctors told me for me uh like basically lifting all those heavy weights and squatting and then going out there uh running doing repetitive reps over and over again. So it wasn't it's nothing similar for me just to happen for the stress pressure happen, but basically over time during that process, me just waking up every morning, uh lifting, running, uh, you know, it, it just the stress pressure it just got there. But I do remember one particular play though, I had a deep post in practice. This one made me finally realize something wasn't right. I had a deep post in practice. I jumped for the ball and mm-hmm. I landed on my uh like, like landed on my my back. I just got up feeling a little funny, but I continued practicing. But I want to say like the next day or two, man, like I remember being impressed, man. I wasn't like moving. It felt a little funny. I remember telling my coach like, man, like I'm sore right here. Like it just feel funny. It felt like a, it felt like I had a line drawn through my back where I needed to keep bending down and stretching. Mm-hmm. So as they, you know, and then me just being an athlete and, and it's campus football, I've, everybody's sore. So I just felt like, man, it's just going to go away on its own. You know what I'm saying? I, I never really had any ma- major injuries before. So, but it's right, so kind of going. So yeah, you're, yeah, you're so, thinking it's almost like getting beat up in practice. Like it's just yeah, those, I'm thinking I'm those just usual sore, bumps man. and bruises. Yeah, I'm just sore. So I finally went to the trainers about it. Like, man, like something not right. So, you know, they think it's probably the same thing, just muscular. So, man, I go, I go in. You know, throughout the season, we played Clemson. Uh, I was checking T. Higgins. He did the deep post. I was over the top, but I ended up pulling my hamstring. So, with my, like, I, I don't like being hurt, but I'm just blessed that I pulled my hamstring because if it wasn't for my hamstring, I would have never, they would have never, I would have never got the MRI to show my stress fracture when I've been complaining about it. So, um, I, we finally do the MRI. They do the MRI on my damn hamstring and they see it on my back. 
fracture. Then I had the stress fracture. Man. I had an L5 stress fracture. So I had to sit out for the whole season, man, and, and just, man, that was sucky because it's like all this expectation was on me. All this hype was around um, me knowing I'm that dude. But, you know, I went out there and laid a couple eggs and it's like, ah, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I, I did my thing, man. Like, shoot. Um, prior to that that year, shoot, I let PFF in almost everything. Lower pass rate target, all that. That's the same year I think Denzel Ward, he went number three pick. I let everybody in PFF my sophomore year. So Yeah, and, I think for the state well, and for the state we played nothing we was nothing but press man too. So I, I know when coming out uh, when talking about your draft stock, this is again, I, I this is why I love this write up and it keeps referencing it. And I doing my back research for you, you know, you put on uh, one of the top 20 uh, quote, quote, freaks coming out of college in terms of intangibles for uh, right. some of the metrics in terms of like baselines for grading, kind of uh, strength, agility, if you name it, for some of the, for some of your stats. And you know, it sometimes it, I feel like you know, you get that bad season and you kind of have to recoup. I've seen it a lot of times with other right. folks we talk, we've talked to in this league or have talked to in other alternative leagues. So like, right. I love talking with you because, you know, you're getting to hit the field here, truthfully get bigger starting reps than maybe previous opportunities. There was, was this, and you were in Saskatchewan for the CFL and you did get to hit some right. NFL camps, but now you're, you've been a starter pretty much this entire season doing your thing, right. getting legit film on that side. And so I think that's great. Like I love, right. that's why I love with you get that wraparound story and you see like, Hey, I'm still continuing my career, but now I get my next shot. You know, even if it doesn't go, even you don't get that straight road to where you want to go to, right. you still can take that. As long as you fight your way back to the path you want to be at, exactly. you still do what you like to do. Yeah. Cause what keep, what keep me pushing is, Man, it's, it's guys that I know who in the league and guys who I have a good relationship that's in the league who tell them all the time that, like, man, you better than this dude. Like, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, I know that as well. I just got to get there. I got to keep working, keep grinding. I got people to depend on me. I have my kids, my family, you know what I'm saying? So I, I just wake up every day with that chill on my shoulder to go out here and just play the game I love and football. Like, I really love football. So. Mm -hmm. Man, I just, you know, I'm just blessed to be able to be here just to showcase that. Because um, when I was with, when I when I joined the Rams in 2020, you know, COVID hit. So, it was like, I didn't really get no opportunity at that because that's when, you know, they didn't know anything about it. Wearing a mask, anything. Only thing that was good around that time was if you had antibodies. That's the only thing that they knew about. Mm -hmm. um, they ended up canceling with preseason games. All of that, man. So, a lot of camps. I mean, a lot of tryouts were canceled that year, too. Yeah, no. Uh, what else? They they canceled um, all type of stuff. Man. I couldn't even go do pro like pro day. None of that. So um, I just wish I had a, like a real opportunity because I feel like if they would have seen me on the field uh, with whatever, 101, 707, 1111, and the game reps, I feel like I would make a team. Like, I, I'm hoping – I'm yeah. definitely hoping to see your name get drawn when we talk about, you know, off season items as well as many others in this league. Honestly, a lot of Panthers on your squad, as you mentioned, are very talented. You know, and right. again, I actually love to get a little more talk and elaborate on something we talked a bit about about with defensive player of the year nominees. You got Breland Speaks and you got Frank Ginda as two of the big right. names that I think are in that list. Ginda definitely comes off as as the big leader face on that defensive side of the ball um yeah. talk about talk about his voice or how he's been kind of bringing the energy because he he he's at like 115 percent. i feel like yep. every game he's out there breland too yep. i mean you guys a lot of you guys are on that side but it feels like ginda really is kind of that driving force where he's the aggressor and saying we can all be hitting this energy right. every play right oh uh, man yeah again to frank man he green dot man you know he got that green down his helmet making the calls making all the checks and great linebacker, man. You shoot, you see, you see the way he play for himself. Like I don't even have to talk about it. You just pull up the tape and see it. Well, he got ninety three tackles, three interceptions. Come on, man. That's nothing you know, to be <laughs> talked about. <laughs> and then you know, uh, speaks, man. You know, he's a great football player, a dog. He, he get into that quarterback. Like man, run stopper as well too. Don't let the sacks fool you. He can stop the run too. So. uh <laughs> 
man, we got, I got some uh, some great guys on, on on the defense side of the ball, man. Make make my job easier. All I got to do is cover. For you, for cover too. <laughs> oh, hey, you know it, it does help when you get pressure. You know, and Ginda and Speaks they can deliver the pressure. Besides the fact you got the edge rusher on your team, it's leading the league in sacks. You do got a great blitzing right. linebacker and Gin, Ginda as well. Um, and that helps your job out there, but you still got to, you know, you still got some tough competition. Honestly, I asked this with Imani Dennis when I had him on for this interview series. Uh, who's giving you the biggest challenge so far in the season, like kind of covering out there when you've had an opportunity or is it really one, or is one of your guys on your pra- on your own squad yeah. on the other side? Cause I mean, Joe Walker, you know, he's no yeah. slouch. He's one of the top guys in this league too. Right. I feel like the best receivers. Uh, I know coming in here, uh, Joe Walker really batting a lot. We had a lot of battles. Through camp, um, one on one, seven on seven, eleven on eleven. Shoot, even right now, still we pushing each other every day in practice. So when we come to the game time, it's it's time to go. Um, I feel like the uh, the breakers receivers are great. It was my first time giving up like multiple catches in my whole career as well too. Um, the stars have a good, they have a great receiver core too. Uh, we just we just had the best of them. Uh, the first game, so we really didn't get to see what they can really do. But I know they they got great receivers. Mm-hmm. Um, the Maulers, uh receiver number four, Gather, he got he sneaky speed. He got sneaky speed, and he gonna make that catch. He one of those receivers. He's not flashy, but he he can make the, he can make a play on that ball. Their slot too. He I like him too. Seventeen. Oh yeah, he's a good play. He's a good player. Um, shoot. Uh, Alonzo too for the generals. He's a good receiver as well too. He's been a touchdown machine the past couple of weeks. Yeah, Alonzo Moore, yeah, been sticking out really well. Yeah, um, no, it was about probably like best receivers that I didn't, I didn't have had to check this so far this season. Yeah, well, you got a big matchup this week with with Corey Coleman too. Right, Corey and. Coleman. Co- they got shoot. They got a lot of receivers though. Like it's not even just him. They got they, have, they actually got multiple options. You, I mean, they picked up new guys too. You, you know, or the new faces that are showing up. I mean, uh, so last week Terry Wright, you know, played a really good game. Uh, yeah. Coleman, honestly, it's funny because you talk Coleman. We go back to that early that week that earlier season week two matchup, and that, Coleman's been on a different tear. That's not the same Corey Coleman I saw. Yeah. Like first quarter of the year, he has uh, gotten completely ingrained now to where yep. he is like a consistent contributor, and now is looking like he's the best receiver in the USFL. Leads league in yardage, and right. keeps making dazzling plays now as the back end of the year is going on. So uh, definitely, I feel like you're going to be in a bit more challenged. Like, can you even use that tape from week two, or is you, or is that just something you kind of like use more like recent stuff and just say, okay, yeah. this is the guy I should be planning for. Right. Um. Honestly, from week I still can use that film. It, 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 especially, I want to say it, but I can't say it because I play them. But uh, yeah, it's, it, I can definitely go back because um, you know they they run some of the similar similar stuff. Uh, but now they've been putting in a new formation, the, the double tight snap formation. They've been using a lot lately. Um, that was pretty different that they that they've been doing, but they still did it. But they do it to one side. Um, but but definitely, I um I, I just watched that that game film the other day just to see, because you know sometimes a quarterback can't make every throw, but a receiver might be open. So right. I got to go back. I got to go back and what was open, what was not open, and then see what they're doing, seeing what, how they're attacking different coverages, their landmarks, their split. You know what I'm saying? So I feel like you know overall though they they do have the best receiving court overall. From from one to four option, they have the best receiving core. I'm not even gonna lie. It'll be a fun challenge for you guys up ahead. I'm lo- I'm looking forward to it, even though I am, of course, I'll be more the fan sitting there going, "Oh, I hope this I hope this pans out." I will be rooting for you guys harder than harder than I even have all year, and that's saying some something for without a doubt. You got a bunch of Panthers fans behind me with you with right. you guys too. Uh, but it should be a fun game. And uh, yeah. Levante, glad glad to have you on. Really. Great conversation for you. Wishing the best for you. And uh, no matter what happens after this game, I'm looking forward to the future that's ahead for you one way or another in the pro scene. Yes, sir, man. I'm just, This Sunday, man, when I go home, I know I, I, man, I'm looking to make make a lot of plays, man. 
Just, you know, go ahead, go ahead and stamp that all USFL team, man. I really think I deserve it. Shoot, yeah. To no. be honest, who, who not coming up. We play man to man every play. No help, zero touchdowns. And I'm That's looking forward to keep that streak going. And you know best. That takes that takes a lot more skill to be able to say I can read and react. I can keep up with your twitch movements. You know, you're at right. the disadvantage. You know, exactly. You're in disadvantage when you're man. So definitely some consideration. I'll put I'll put in my vote if I get a chance. <laughs> yeah, put in your vote, man. <laughs> Latte, thank you for tuning for joining me on this. Really appreciate the time. Looking forward to seeing you on the on the field here in Detroit this coming Sunday night. Should be a blast one way or another. Um yes, sir. and wishing you the best for this game and moving yes, forward. Sir. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Special thanks again to defensive back Levante Taylor joining the show and just sitting down for a conversation uh, twofold because I love sitting down and talking with Panthers players again, my favorite team. So I, got, I, I get that. I get a double whammy there. I get to sit down with a USFL player who's been in the, in the trenches all year and kind of talk about his journey. And then I get to, of course, chat with the Panthers player. But I mean, again, you know, it's been a, it's been a journey for him. Like I said, you talk about, you know, five-star recruit coming out, out in college, playing at an FSU's Florida State University's roster at the time, changing over from when Jimbo Fisher was leaving town. So that's that. And then also dealing with the, this is what got mm-hmm. me Stefan. And like I said, it sticks with me just reading up on his story and talking with him, him describing a stress fracture in his back. Oh, that, I, I mean, the fact when he said it feels like pain lines going up and down after he fell down, uh, that one's rough, but you know, he, he's making the most of it. Like, that's the thing. He's, he, he had a bad, like that 2018 season is feeling like it's in the past because he's been, He's been a contributor and, you know, we, we've looked into it and, you know, he's made his case known like, Hey man, I've been playing good ball and the stats don't lie. And they're playing man coverage, which he ain't wrong. Mm. If you play man coverage and you can do it well as a DB, you can go anywhere. Like man coverage is hard to play as a DB because you are always at a disadvantage to the receiver. Right. Right, right. Every situation you're in, you have to be the best at reactionary play. Now you and the Panthers do. Oh it yeah, oh yeah, on a regular basis. Now, now you mentioned he was a contributor. I have to, I have to wonder. So I haven't had a chance to listen to the interview yet. I will when I edit all this down. Uh, but did you tell him that one of the contributors to our fine show is the Panther, the number one Panthers fan? <laughs> I, uh, I did say that you are a f- uh, well. I know I did. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was trying to re- think back really quick. I'm like, uh, I mentioned you in the show. Definitely didn't mention the Panther thing. That's about it. What you mentioned. <laughs> if you see a guy in a ref shirt attack. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, no. I left that one alone. He can deal with it himself. Uh, no, I was saying when we were talking about lo- researching into, into him mm. and his play, which you know, again, he's he's been doing a good job. He's been locking down his side when he's gotten targets. Now, credit, he did get a few passes go his way against against the breakers that weren't that he did say, and he admitted in the show that he let go a little bit. So he knows, but he still is very team first. Like he's talk, he's get you know him giving praise to Frank Ginda, Breland Speaks. I mean, those are two defensive player of the year nominations, and you know, it's weird. The North kind of has most of the defensive right. player of the year leaders right now. I mean, we talk about Tizino obviously over there in <laughs> with the Maulers. Mm-hmm. I mean, they've been making us think about, Hey, this guy's getting disrespected, but he's right in the fray with speaks and with Ginda. You know, I think if you look over in the South, there are options if you want, I think polling, although less work and body of work, which was kind of an issue with voting last year. Remember case cook right. for example, was not let that one go. So, you know, there's a lot of options you can kind of think about. The North has a lot of them, though. Mm-hmm. The South's got a lot of the offensive options for the most part to talk about on that other side. Interesting how that all worked out. Um, talking about options, let's look at some playoff scenarios here. Playoff scenarios. And man, oh, man, boy, oh, boy, if you will. Boy, oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. This is like an extra week of playoffs. Even though the Stallions have clinched <laughs> their clinched their 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 standing, there's very much a reason for them to win and in my case lose and we'll get to that here uh let's start with the north plain and simple win and you're in across the board and uh for philadelphia it's extra special because if they get the win they are the division champs now if the panthers win though they don't get that luxury they do get in the playoffs 
But then it leads now to the winner of the, the Maulers and the Generals game. So we could see the Generals go into this as the division champions. Uh, I mean, last week's game was pretty scary, so I wouldn't put it out of the question. Uh, but when we look at the South, uh, this is where things get real sticky because it's like it's gridlock everywhere. So we mentioned the Stallions. They already punched their ticket. But if they win this game, division champs, home field advantage. You know they're going to want that. Luke has already brought it up. This will be like the first football playoff game in ages, I think, since the original USFL. 1991. Yeah. Uh, that's the last time there's been a playoff, a professional football game that is a playoff game in Birmingham, Alabama. Mm-hmm. And I believe that's uh, WLAF. I think it's the WLAF days, if I am thinking, right. if I am placing that correctly. Because it wasn't. It definitely wasn't USFL. Right, that was right, post- right the original launch and it was just before the CFL's expansion into America, which the Barracudas were okay. They weren't playoff good. Um, so that was W that was the world league of American football at the time. Yep. So it's been well over third pushing 30 years. Yeah. Mm. 32 years since Birmingham's had a professional playoff game in their city and they're close to it i mean zach do you want to go through the the gauntlet of situations that we have going on down in the south here yeah so you mentioned of course the south division is the stallions if they win or if new orleans loses so really they have they have an either or here um one way or another new orleans they have a little bit they pretty much have the most straightforward of the remaining three to just clinch Mm -hmm. uh, as the deal so We'll go through the whole thing, though. The, the Breakers can clinch the South with a win and a Stallions loss. Uh, the Breakers will clinch a playoff spot just if they win. That's it. All they got to do is go in, sweep the Gamblers for the season series, and that's it. I know he's looking at that, but hey, that's what they got to do. <laughs> <laughs> these, aren't, these aren't what's happening. These are the facts, as I understand <laughs> it. Uh, <laughs> if Houston wins against New Orleans and Mem- Memphis beats Birmingham – the three teams in question, that is New Orleans, Memphis, and Houston, all will finish six and four with three and three in the division. So they then go to the gauntlet of tiebreakers to decide their fate, which is this is where Memphis gets screwed mm-hmm. over because they, they have the worst one with the net points, right. is the deal. So here's the tiebreakers that we're going to be talking about, and you're going to go, and this goes in descending order. Uh, USFL comms posted this a few weeks back and made sure it's out and available. They'll probably post it up before Mm. the playoffs start or really the week 10 playoffs as we'll call them start, uh, here, but here's the head up. Here's how it goes. First off head to head matchup. So you sweep your opponent. Congrats. You, you know, you kind of win that tiebreaker best win loss percentage in games played within a division. Well, okay. So that's two tiebreakers right Mm -hmm. there. You kind of acts in that scenario strength of victory aggregated win loss percentage of teams defeated and eh, well yep. a little bit a little bit all over the board but they would kind of be splitting each other so again we talk about that same issue it comes down really to net point net points is the deal it, the new orleans is so far ahead of the other two mm-hmm. in net points right, right, right. They, they did so much of their damage to start the season and in wins like against memphis they've differentiated themselves in that regard. Mm -hmm. So as long as Houston, as long as you don't, sorry, as long as new Orleans doesn't let everything just completely fall off the wagon and they get things done, or if they keep it close against the gamblers, you should see them get in. Houston's going to have to play their best football game in the season. And there's, and again, there's possibility. I mean, they can play up to it. You just got to take every chance you get. Every point is important. Memphis, it's a very outside chance. Oh yeah. That it really is outside. They have to have everything go perfect. Um, honestly, I bet in terms of sports outside chances to clinch, it'd be like one of the most insane clinching scenarios. I mean, in, in professional football, but I bet you here we I are. I bet you if you're a gambling man, there's some pretty good odds out there. If you want to throw a little bit of money at it on the craziest thing that you've ever seen. Uh, but I mean, that's not even also, well, then we go down to best net touchdowns in all games, which I don't think we'll get to, but the one scenario, Zach, I want to see it one year. We talked about this last year. Let it come down to a coin flip. I want to see, just for anything, I want to see the fans of the losing team 
their react. I mean, that will be worth it in, in itself. I want to see the tie of all ties. And you know what? I'll take the heat. Let me flip the coin. The ultimate ref. You? Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on now. The, the day we get to a coin toss is the day I'm going to take a photo and say, this was where I was in this moment in history right. when a professional football <laughs> team clinched a playoff off of a gosh darn coin. I could say something else, but I want to be doubly safe. Nonetheless, though, man, um, it, it is going to come down basically to net points mm. because they, they, you think about it this way. Memphis would then split the series against Birmingham and New Orleans and Houston. Right. Same goes for New Orleans. Same goes for Houston. All of them would be split. Right. So that really does mean you come down to net points. Oh, yeah. In the net points scenario, if that was all tied, we'd be like, whoa, this is trippy. Net touchdowns, we'd definitely be like, whoa, this is really. Like, if you get to coin toss, there's been a lot of. You like, have to. It has to be a coin. forces affecting this stuff at this point. It, yeah, it has to be I'm a saying. coin toss. It has to be like a ref's law situation where it's like just one or the other all the way down the line. Uh, but yeah, like I said, I don't think we'll get to that, but we might get to these tiebreakers. We very well, very well might, uh, depending on what happens in week 10 and man, oh man, oh man, boy, oh boy, oh boy. Am I looking forward to it before we get to week 10? Don't want to touch on this very much. You know, the news has been blowing up on the discord. I just want to touch on this. I just want to say what we, what we've heard just from you know, this, not even our sources, just what was said out there. But according to Sports Business Journal, uh, John Orand, we got Disney is not paying rights fees to the XFL. I'm not going to sit here and say one way or the other. I will say this, though. I will say this. Our team is on, on the job. So I will say look forward to a much more in-depth article on XFL Newsroom. And honestly, it might even be there by the time this podcast drops. But like I've told other people, we'll drop it when it's ready, not when it's rushed. We want it to be right. But let's let's go over this because I think there's some interesting nuggets. Again, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. But, you know, this is coming hot off the heels of an article that came out in Forbes maybe a week or two ago that mentioned the, uh, the XFL lost $60 million in their first season, which I think everybody expected them to lose money. Any, any, any business, whether it's a football business or a taco shop, or whatever it is, you're probably going to lose money in the first year, unless you're a smoke well, shop. Well, that, there's a lot enough. of upstart costs. That's the thing. You get a lot of that early losses from upstart costs mm. that go in. You know, so that's the deal. But yeah, I mean, that came up this week, you know, or this past week with the 60 million thing, which, you know, in numbers is, uh, think about some of the other attempts. That's very good. Mm. So, if anything, it, I take this, and you, you can keep going. A lot of what you're going to bring up is a lot of stuff that I think is more the landscape of spring football right now. Mm -hmm. Like we reference it, and I know some folks talk about it, but like there is competition. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> like we know that we respect that side, but like there is pieces where we have to bring up that well, section. I here's guess. the thing: is everyone on the Discord is is pinging and pinging and pinging. They want to know more and more and more. And like I said, I'm not going to go over all the details. There's some stuff that I know that I'm not going to even bring up here because, you know, I want to go through the proper motions. Newsroom does it right. Newsroom's where the facts at. Uh, but I'll, I'll tell you this. I think I told you this earlier, this, this Forbes article very, I used to work in politics feels very political to me. Uh, I thought it was interesting that there was an article even going out there with the amount of money they lost in a year. And, you know, I'm not going to say the number, but I've heard a, a different number. We'll say on the higher side above 60 million, and so that gets my noggin jogging on, oh, okay, is this, where's this information coming from? Because, you know, you kind of get slapped in the face with the $60 million loss, but the more you dive into the article, I don't want to say it's a PR, but it's very PR-y in the fact of, well, we lost 60 or they lost 60 million, but they made $20 million in rights fees, which is reported and then uh, now reported that it's not even true. So We'll get to the bottom of that, where the situation's kind of breaking down. And then it starts going into sponsorships. And like I said, we're not going to go through all the details now. There's going to be a big piece over on XFL Newsroom. Keep an eye on it. Newsroom, we got the goods. Uh, but I felt it was worth touching about because I know if we didn't, Zach, I know, 
I know, no curtains. But if we didn't, our Discord would say, Ref, why didn't you talk about that? Why didn't you even touch on it? Um, but here's the real deal. At the end of the day, I don't want the XFL to fold. I kind of like the idea of competition. More importantly, you never want to see people lose their jobs. Uh, at Realistically, whether the XFL survives or doesn't survive, I think the USFL is on a good path. Do I see the USFL around in year three, year five, year 10, year 20? Yes. So if you're, if you're an, I guess, let me position it like this. If you're a USFL fan or a spring football fan in general, and you're looking at the news about the XFL and you're worried that this could maybe breach outside of that, I don't think it will. Will it even be the death of the XFL? I don't think it will. I, I, I would almost put money out a Stefan T that we'll see the XFL in season two, season three, season four. That, I mean, that's where I think you really need to get into crunch time. I'm not going to dive into layoffs and seasonal contracts and all this and that everybody's got an opinion there. And I don't necessarily know if anybody wants to hear mine. Right. But I, if I ignored this, I would not hear the end of it, Zach. And I, I, you know me, I ignore the DMs, but I see them. I see your dirty little DMs attacking and poking and prodding. Leave ref alone. It ain't easy being the ref. So there it is. We talked about it. Now, I'll tell you this. Once the article's out, if there's anything of interest or how it relates to the beautiful USFL and the USFL podcast, sure, we'll touch base. But here's the thing. What do we know with the US fell? Boom. They got Fox owning them. So the broadcast piece is taken care of. They also have NBC ponying up. A number has never been put out there, but we knew know that they're receiving rights fees from mm -hmm. a competitor, which is pretty crazy. So things are looking on the up and up. Both are essentially going to be looking at negotiating rights in similar time zones just a year out. Uh, so I think we'll see more details there. But if you're a USFL fan worried about the USFL, I wouldn't be. If you're an XFL fan worried about the XFL, I wouldn't be. Uh, maybe next year, we'll have a different discussion. So there it is. That's the piece. Everybody enjoy. And I'm sure I'll still get hate from that online too, Zach. But you know what? I don't really care. You know why? The final week of the USFL season is here. Season two, here the go. first season two in nearly 40 years. And we're about to cap that bad boy off. And I'm getting hype. I'm getting excited. And man, oh man, playoffs are on the line left and right. Zach, you want to tell them what's coming up first? Oh, yes, I do. We got to lead off for your Saturday slate on USA Pittsburgh Maulers are going to be taking on the New Jersey Generals, the two arguably best defenses in the league, two that are claiming on each other's side that they're the best in the North, by the way, or best in the league, are taking each other on head-to-head, -head. haven't seen each other since earlier on in the year. Um, going to be a slugfest. Last time these two played, 20-3 to affair, Generals came out on top, but it was not easy. It was, uh, it was definitely a typical black and blue, in the mud type of game to kick things off during the year. One key caveat, though, that we'll be talking about, Troy Williams was not starting that game. That was still a James Morgan affair that they did switch around quarterbacks for. So keep that in mind. Williams being in to start things off might change a few things, but going to be a defensive slugfest. I imagine a, a low-scoring game in this Week 10 affair. We're also going to touch, of course, this is a pick'em. Mm -hmm. So uh, keep that in mind while I'm bringing this up. here. And here's the thing. It is going to be in Canton, so no worries about home or away type of affairs here. You don't have any advantages going mm -hmm. on. Um, my point is this. Uh, we saw this past week you have the trio, DJ, Trey Williams, Darius Victor, all are back in sync, all are going to be playing at full, you shouldn't expect anything, any funny business going on on the offensive side of the ball. Mm -hmm. And defensively, they are healthy. Chris Orr is fully healthy. Shalom Awani was out for a week, and he's back too. He's back last game as well. But like those are leaders that are in at the right time. Mm -hmm. Pittsburgh, I think you're sitting there and you're going, hey, we got a chip on our shoulder. We, we had a lot of crap thrown our way for being 1-9 and nine last season. A lot of these returning guys are hungry. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And I think they get it done. They might get it done. I mean, I, this is anyone's I game. Think, I mean, I think Pittsburgh 
with Ray Horton being there from last year, you know, you got Jaren. Or, well, sorry, with Jaron Horton. I know I mixed yeah, yeah, them up. Yeah, it's all good. With Jaron being there from last year, he's got his dad on the sidelines now. You know, they know they've been close all year. Oh, yeah. And I know the generals are sitting there going, we've got our best of right now to end the season. I think the Maulers are just that bit hungry. They've been, they, I mean, a lot of those guys think that they've been looked over mm-hmm. this year. You know, that, hey, we're, some of us have been put down as the typical Maulers. We're not that same team. I don't think they are. I think they come out, you know, Williams being under center this full time, having the most time behind center now and being the guy mm. for sure. I think they get it done. It's going to be tight. I think that you won't, I don't think you see a team hit 20. Maybe you do, but I don't think you see a team hit 20. I think it's going to come down to who flinches, basically who yeah, flinches yeah. last. Oh, yeah, 100%. Yeah, that's I it. mean, this game, to me, it could go either way. It, it, it really comes down to, Who's going to show up more, the Pittsburgh defense or the New Jersey offense? Now, if we didn't, if if we cancel out last week, my my answer would be like a hundred percent the Mahler's defense. But if the Generals can repeat what they did last week, I mean, those general the the Mahler's defense is going to be working some overtime. Which who knows? This could be the game. That takes us to overtime. I mean, I would love to see an overtime week 10 with playoffs on the line. Right? Think of that. Think of that. Especially if it's in the South that takes it to a tiebreaker. So an overtime that takes you to a tiebreaker that takes you this list, this list, this list, like halfway down the list. We could see it happen. In this game, whew, it, it's, I'm glad I'm not picking it. But you know what? I'm going to shoot myself in the foot for the next two games that I'm picking here because I'm going home or pick, Zach. And if you don't know what that means, everyone, well, I'm going to break it down. Game two, we got the little old Stallions. They've already got their playoff spot taking on the Showboats who, man, they got a hell of a hill in front of them. But I'll tell you this. Todd Haley is probably twerking so much. To build oh, wow. the to get the power back into those showboats. Let's remember earlier in the season they got that first win. Haley starts shaking that rump four more games in a row. And so, you know, they got a lot of points to throw down. So Haley's throwing it down too. And I think the showboats are pulling this out on just points alone. They are gonna have to throw up so many points. Are they gonna get that differential? You know, I don't I don't think that's all going to go down. This one's at 4 p.m. Eastern on Fox. I think the showboats are going to pull it out. Zachy boy, what are your thoughts? Yeah, oh, you think the showboats will take mm-hmm. it? I, I don't I don't fully disregard because my angle is, you know, since you are playing in Birmingham next no matter what, right. no matter what, the South championship is in Birmingham. There's no way you can play it in Memphis. Mm-hmm. It, it was locked in last week when both Memphis teams lost. So if you're the stallions, you know, I, I mean, sure. You want that title, I guess for the division, but if you're skip Holtz, you're sitting, Hey, division title doesn't maybe matter as much here because we're looking at the eyes on the prize at the mm-hmm. end. Maybe we give our guys a little rest. Maybe we give them a little, you know, get them kind of, chill out, you know, maybe only subbing guys that just got back, like give Scooby some reps and come in. This is what I'm curious about. Now I imagine skip's going to play full is is Mm why I'm probably going to pick Birmingham, but if, if he does do like a second half where you see like a Jalen Morton in or someone like that behind center, I won't be surprised. Uh, I'll be Frank. I will go. That's what I'm hoping for. Fair enough. That's what I'm hoping for here, buddy. I mean, you're, you don't need to play for anything like really, you know, you have your home right. game, even if it is a away game. And sure, that will not be in later years. But in this situation with the league as it is now, you have a lock home game right. well, in real in reality. And they kind of have the division locked down anyway, because let's be honest. Well, I won't tell you my pick yet, but I, I, <laughs> I you know what? I will. We'll talk about the next game shortly, but they already know that Houston's going to shellac the breakers. So they're going to get that division title. (laughs) And I mean, they kind of have to a certain extent, a little say in who they play 
in the playoffs in, in, in that manner. But I think the showboats pull it out. Is it going to be a blowout? I don't think so. Uh, I think they edge out the win, but I think they're going to put up a hell of a lot of points. And and I am a little bit banking on the fact that the showboats and Coach, Coach Holtz rest his team a little bit in the second half because you kind of should. Big game on the line the week following uh, that essentially takes you back to the championship, which is ultimately the the prize here. So I'm um, showboats locking it in 4 p.m. Eastern on Fox, which takes us to our next game. We got the breakers. We got the gamblers. We got 4 p.m. Eastern on FS1. And you know what? I've never felt more all in in my life. Look me in the eyes, Zach. Cats out of the bag. We're huh? winning this game. We're going in and we're winning this game so good. Dice in one hand, chips in the other. All in, baby. Let's go. Mark Thompson, you might say, oh, his chance at MVP is over. They lost to the Stallions last week. I say no, no, no. Because when Mark Thompson goes all in, all in, all in on this game and pulls in three, four, and I'll even say it maybe five touchdowns and gets this team into the playoffs after not making it last year, I think the argument's there, at least enough of an argument, to keep Mark Thompson in this MVP picture. And I think it's going to happen. The Breakers, the only thing they did last week is fool themselves. They came in. They won convincingly. They're going to come into this Houston game, trappiest trap game of their entire lives. The trappiest trap game that Coach Flip has ever coached in his career. The script hmm. is being flipped, and Coach Flip ain't going to like it one bit. And that's all I have to say, except for this. Four words. Gamblers win all in. Fascinating, man. I'll tell you, I'm not... I will say that I'm not as confident as you are, but I do think this one, hey, 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 <laughs> I didn't finish. Hey, you can back off. I get it. You're, you have the fandom. You, you, you just want all in for the entire answer. But I don't think this is as a cut and dry a game as some people. I can see a lot of people saying, oh, it's New Orleans. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. they got that win last week. They're two in a row now. They're back on track. No, no, no. Hang on now. Hang on now. Houston's defense is no slouch. And I saw one of the poorest performances from Memphis last week. Yes, their defense carried them. Mm -hmm. The for that majority of that contest, they carried them. They put the offense in situations to get quick scores. Congratulations! You got to do it again. Last time these two met up, you know, both of them put up 30, 30 yep. plus. It took a New Orleans fourteen point swing and some turnovers to switch that game back in favor of the Breakers. So, if Houston can find some of that magic from Week Two that they had in the first half of the year. If Kenji Barr can get a little bit comfortable, maybe we see something and find a balance where he is comfortable throwing and then handing off. I know that they, they lean on Mark Thompson a lot more since he's come back. And for obvious reasons, mm -hmm. the man is a workhorse and honestly still is in the running for offensive player of the year. Funny enough with the guy across from him in West Hills, right in my right. eyes or a Corey Coleman in Philadelphia right now, uh, unless you want to pick another quarterback, but you know, that being said, that balance, I want to see Kenji come in. If he's going to get a win, they're going to need one of his best efforts of the season. Unless Mark Thompson carries him, but I wouldn't fully guarantee that. The Breakers are one of the better run defenses in the USFL. Just pointing that out there. So that will be a thing you're going to contest with. Von Tate Diggs and Gerard Fernandez have been doing a great job helping clog holes in those first two levels. It's going to be a tough slog to get those yards. You can still get it, but you need to capitalize in the past game where the breakers have been susceptible at times during the year. And that's going to come down to Kenji Bahar and company. I think Justin Hall and Josh P and Josh Peterson have to have their best games of the season. Justin Hall, especially mm -hmm. he's disappeared the last few weeks. He's one of my favorite receivers in the league, not because of the fact he's a ball state alum, <laughs> but also because he is a scrappy dude and they haven't been getting him enough touches. I want more Justin Hall involved in this offense and they can do it there is a path to victory here houston 
has shown they can keep up with the big dogs. The South is all over the place. The ball is in their court. They're destiny to do this. They have to get a win, mm-hmm. though. And then if they get a win, hope Memphis takes the loss, then it comes a little more down to how things pan out is the deal between these two. It's going to be tight coming to the end. Uh, but I I still – you're going to hate me for this. I still pick New Orleans. I I know. I know. I see the squint. I see it. I, you're fired, I, Zach. You're out of here. God. It only took a 61 episode. I stuck, episodes. I stuck through the entire year, <laughs> and I made it to week 10, and he dropped the hammer. <laughs> I can't call fire a, you call anyway. Me a, call me a sales or P, call me a sales or media rep because apparently I got the. <laughs> yeah, <answer>. there you <laughs> go. <laughs> oh man, you know what? I, 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 we'll leave it. I, I'll forgive you now because I just feel bad that you're wrong because we're going all in. Gamblers win, <laughs> which takes us to our. I mean, final game of the week, Zach. I am looking forward to this one only because I'm going to be there. <laughs> Uh, Detroit, Man. I mean, what can you say about a good old local Detroit game? We got the Stars. We got the Panthers. Zach, break it down for us. Well, we got. I think to me we've got some cut and dry items. First off, it's the final home game of the Panthers season. Uh, crowd's looking good based on ticket sales from the looks of it, which they've had plenty of weeks to do it. And honestly, you would think right off the bat that the support that the Detroit community has gotten for the most part for being the largest market and still coming out – you would think that I would give confidence that that helps out in this case. And yet they've lost four home games Mm -hmm. is the deal. And I know that's, that's a cursed territory. You're like, yeah, Zach, what still comes down to performance? You're right. You're right. You know, but in this, you know, I'm superstitious. They've lost five. They've lost four of their home Mm -hmm. games this year. All four of them. This is the last chance to reverse it. They have to take on Phil. They have to take on Philadelphia who is coming off. Who's coming off a game that they feel like, they let slip away and that they are kind of desperate knowing it's a win and right. and that they are playing in prime time once again, but now they have to play in front of a legit home crowd in Detroit. I just have a little more certainty of Philadelphia here. And my, my mind is saying, dude, just pick the stars and get over it with it. But I'm going to be the sucker Panthers fan and go with the Panthers because screw it. You know what? I'm a Bears fan. I haven't had much to root for for few years. I want a playoff team. Come on, Michigan. Deliver me to the promised land. I don't even care what happens in the playoffs. Just get me there. Right. Give me a game I can be like, oh, my God, I got a playoff team I can root for. I think if Michigan's going to win, the keys to victory were shown off last week against New Jersey. Here's the deal. You got to get back to getting Case Cookus knocked down and flattened on his back. Mm-hmm from sacks, pressures, and hits. That's the deal. They're weaker at running back right now. Philadelphia's been figuring things out. They just released Darnell Holly. They got Paul Terry back, but there's no Matt Colburn. Mm-hmm. They were a little different without Matt Colburn out there. Right. They ha- they weren't as much identifying in the run game, so you got to hold down the pass. Tougher c- decision this time, given the fact that, you know, Corey Coleman, this time around, compared to week two, he's got oh, his yeah. legs under him. You know, they've had, they have a few options they can still attack you with, but I, Michigan to me, I know they can do this. I, there, this roster, I have no, they can pull this off on paper, but that all, I mean, defensively, it's going to be your best game in the secondary you're going to play, or you're going to have to hope that Frank Ginda, Breland Speaks, Garrett Marino and company are getting back there consistently and making Case Cooks' life a living hell. That that's, that's going to be the deal. Offense. I'll tell you, man, Philadelphia, last few weeks as well, defensively, been kind of leaky. And it's not like the Panthers don't have options. Cole Hickettini, right. Joe Walker, they, don't, they might not have Reggie Corbin, but you got Stevie Scott and company that can anchor this. I'm going to go with them. I'm trying to convince myself <laughs> to pick Michigan. As much as they have back and forth made me burned over the year, I just feel like, you know what? It would be the magical moment on a primetime set. Their final home game. Just give give it to them. Oh, yeah. I'm going with them. It, my mind is like screaming at me. You idiot. Yeah. But I'm going to take this- it. I'm going to take it. It's the end of the year. Give me my Panthers. Buy a field goal. Ironically, buy a field goal for revenge. The revenge field for goal. missing a 25-yard chip shot last year because Philadelphia decided to post that as retribution on their social this week. You know what? Screw <laughs> you. You know what's going to happen? And I hate it for my buddy Luis Aguilar there. He's going to miss the shot 
and oh, we're going to walk away. Man, wouldn't that be win. one after that game earlier this season? I'll tell you, this one might be the hardest one for me to decide because there's there's so many factors. We talked about it. There's the players. There's the you know the stars. Man, they play a hell of a game after dark. They couldn't pull it out last week, but they have the wherewithal within them. The Panthers, hell of a defense. Have a little bit of problem on offense. If they could stop those interceptions, I think they have a chance. But let's, I mean, let's not ignore the other factors here. I mean, Ford Field, thorn right in the side of the Panthers all season. That's a big one, glaring one, right in your face. It has, man. And I'll be honest with you, Zach. I'll be truly 100% honest with you. I have a feeling I might not be as much of a good luck charm as I originally thought. Um, you know, we f- rewind to week one during the preseason when the Gamblers lost to the Panthers week one. Uh, I, I, I was there. I was there for that. Fast forward a little bit to week three. Michigan Panthers opening things up at Ford Field. I was there. Didn't work out the way we wanted. Uh, week 10, we're going to have to see. I mean, with with ref's law being broken last week, anything's on the line, and it's all on the line. Re- reverse. Rever- give me the ref's law where we both use the retribution. I want both win. Oh, I think I'll take the stars, it. though, I just think that tradition lives on. The Stars make it to the playoffs, and dare I say, we're going to be seeing the Stars in the champion again, baby. Uh, that's also another manifest destiny thing, too. Like that's the that's the other thing on the opposite buoy is that whole Philadelphia's never not been in the playoffs. They've always been the championship squad in one way or another, and I'm like. <clears throat> my brain, I'm telling you, my brain right now, as much as I'm talking, it's my heart talking right now. My brain's like, give me the controls. Well, you are crazy. Don't feel <laughs> bad. Are. Look at what I did. I I mean, I picked the homerist home picks. All I, can, I picked the showboats and the gamblers purely for the playoff scenario alone. So I can't be mad at you. I, I shouldn't ignore this, though, Zach. We are razor thin. We might as well be one of these USFL teams when it comes to our pick numbers. I'm seven and nine. You're even on the season eight and eight. So, I mean, (laughs) I could edge this out if the Panthers screw you, Zach. If somehow, some way, like I said, dice in one hand, chips in the other, all in, I might be able to do this. We'll we'll see. We will see. Wouldn't it be a stinger, Mm. though? The Panthers win and it's the Maulers that lose. And it was your homer pick that actually works out for you. But you know what, guys? You're just going to have to tune in next week. But you'll know how I'm feeling because I don't care what state you're living in, whether it's mainland or uh, Hawaii or uh, Alaska, you will hear me at this game. Actually, you'll hear me before the game uh, when the gamblers inevitably win. You're going to hear, you're going to hear, gamblers win. Oh, this this is actually, this is a great win. What is my window shaking, you know? This is a great game for you to go to, know, just knowing who you are, uh, <laughs> simply because not only do you get to go back to Detroit and you're going to be watching your second team in Michigan, they, as much as I do give you crap, that is your yeah. second team, uh, but it's WWE night. Oh, yeah. Big in e. the building. They're giving away specialty WWE shirts, uh, and Big E and uh, New Day are going to kick me. New Day? Yep. And New Day. They're gonna, New Day is going to be there, the, the crew. I'm so going to get a picture. It's a with final these shebang. Dudes. Like they're trying to make it a big deal on many fronts for this final game. So big, big night. Oh, it's going to be a Go bigger night. You know why, Zach? After this Sunday, they're no longer going to call it the new day. You know what they're going to call it? The newer day because they're going to have newer. a ref in their flipping stable. Oh, I almost said a bad word there. But me, oh, Big oh, E, oh. I'm going to sit on his shoulders. He's going to carry me around like a little child, and I'll just throw flags everywhere. Yeah, you know what? Think of this. We've seen in wrestling before where wrestlers roll into the ring and replace the other guy. Imagine me taking out the ref and I roll in one, two, three, new WWE tag team <laughs> champs. Sign them up. Well, I'll get that message along because, you know, me and Big E, we go way back. We go way back. Not really. 
Uh, but I will. We'll get that picture with Big E. And you know what? I'd pay Newer good money day. if you told me that was the script of a, of the of a match was you had to pin the guy or that you had to call the three count for the pin. I've been a referee on multiple occasions, a real legitimate wrestling referee. I don't know if that re- actually counts as real and legitimate, but I did it and my hand hit the ground. And you know what? I, I'm not going to go into the details, but I've done everything a little bit. Uh, one part of uh, Anyway, now Which, we're getting crazy. Something written down called you to do this and you answered the people, call. That's all you need to people know. People don't know. <laughs> you know, they think this ref thing's like new. This ref thing, it was, you know, uh, I think I, I think I wasn't even able to drink yet. Actually, no, I guarantee it. I think I was 19, maybe 18, but I think I was 19 when I first put on the ref shirt and throughout every endeavor <laughs> that I've had, Somehow the only thing that stuck is this ref shirt. And this shirt is legit. Like I'm not going to date myself. <laughs> Slow down. Then. But it's Let's old. Start. It's old. Bail on, Get out of here. <laughs> it's an old shirt. What can I say? One day. Hey, you know what though? Actually two things. First, before we get into that, uh, no, we'll do this in the right order. I do need a new ref shirt, possibly, potentially, maybe. You know what would be my Christmas present is if one day I went to usflshop.com and there was a brand new, beautiful USFL officials referee shirt ready to be purchased because I will pay you whatever dollarinos you want. You can put them in like Franks. I will pay Franks. I will pay in Juan. I will pay in any currency in any way, I will trade you 12 cows. Just give me, give the ref what the ref needs. And that's an official USFL shirt. But I do have one other thing. This one's not on the notes. No curtains, if you will. Question of the week. All right, Zachy boy. Did you put your cards in your suitcase? Question of the week. <laughs> uh, uh, no. Yes. I love this no. bit. This is my favorite bit. All right. So c- tune in next week, everybody. And we'll find out. Did Zach put his trading cards in his suitcase? If it makes you feel better, Zach. No, I actually, I lied. They are in my suitcase. They, they are, are ready in to your go. bag. You, of course. Oh, sign me up. So tune in next week for maybe the conclusion of this wild storyline, but what a way to ride into the playoffs. Good old question of the week. Good old predictions, picks, good old playoff ties and everything looking in front of us. (sighs) Any, any thoughts before we head into this wild, wild, wild week 10? I'm, uh, I am, uh, if there is any, uh, Pablo, if there's any, any way Pablo Panther can hear me, please give, deliver me a win. That's all I got. I'll tell you. I'm, I'm not even like, I'm, I'm not even fully focused right, right now. It's in the, because at first the cards, but give me a win, Michigan. Come on. You have late. Give, you have, give me, go on. Give me just, that's it. Give me, give me a playoff team to root for. I'm done. Rooting for, I'm done sitting here trying to trying to act like that. What was me fan? I'm ready. Yeah. Just give it. I'll, I'll give you my all, man. I'll give you. I'll give you how I am, which I'm a loud screaming type of fan that goes yes, and then also be the same guy that gets really pissed off next mm-hmm. to you at the bar. Yep. And you'll be like, dude, where the hell did that come from? <laughs> so, I hate to break it to you, Zach. I think you might have late season Detroit fan syndrome, full of hope, but get ready for the tears. I'd say. You might want to invest in Kleenex. You just might want to do I, it. I am a, I am a Bears fan, which is basically diet Detroit Lions <laughs> fandom, just with one Super Bowl. So uh, you know, don't remind that. me, Zach. Don't remind me. But uh, hey, you know, before we head into this wild weekend and really see what the playoffs are going to be looking like, let's end it with this social flip in media. What the hell are you doing at? usfl podcast facebook twitter instagram and even that tiktok baby like i said we're gonna have that summer stock dance come correct but make sure you're following us for all the news all the latest details and hey you know we're gonna be posting up where that summer stock location is gonna be on social media speaking of which two-day event so nice we're doing it twice summer stock two it's kicking off june 30th 
5 p.m. Eastern at the Pro Football Hall of Fame. We're doing a group tour with you, the fans, the USFL yes. fans. Come and witness football history with us the night before the championship where we go and witness more history, which leads us to day two of Summer Stock 2, kicking off at 3 p.m. Eastern. The party's in the parking lot right outside Tom Benson Hall of Fame Stadium within the Hall of Fame Village. We're having a live tailgate and pregame show, and it's going to be live. Like I said earlier, if only half of the things that we're talking about come true, you will not want to miss it. This is the biggest party of the summer, but you can't make it to Canton. We get it. We're also going live on YouTube. Which leads me to my next topic. Go to the YouTube at USFL Podcast. Subscribe. Click the bell. It builds morale. And it also lets you know when we're going live. Just like Summer Stock 2. That's just two short weeks away from today. The day the podcast comes out. June 30th, July 1st. Summer Stock 2. You won't want to miss it but i'll tell you this you might want to get some fresh new merch for the playoffs and the championship that's coming up yes and i can tell you exactly how to do that breaking t's official usfl merch every week they've been putting out new shirts for each of the biggest plays of the week and boy oh boy oh boy oh boy oh boy do we got a lot of shirts for you well we also got 10 percent off using coupon code usfl newsroom a or simply just use breaking t.com slash usfl newsroom for 10 percent off any purchase from breaking tees and boy you gotta love it we got that bowling ball, ball shirt we got them mark trust we shirt we got shark dog shirts we got all sorts of shirts there's a stars blob shirt and even if you're not a fan of the stars you probably want to get your hands on that one but that's it folks we hope you tune into the games this weekend we hope you tune in next week and then two weeks from now summer stock until then sign you up <laughs>